Hello, everybody. If it's Wednesday, it's Warhammer, and that must mean it's time for another episode of Warhammer Weekly. Joining me, not as always, but standing in for Tom, who has been sadly taken by the Nurgle's rot. Uh, we, we'll probably never see him again. He's one now with the plague, but that's okay. Paul Conti, he's here. He's going to go through Nurgle with us. He's ready and, uh, and uh, ready, willing, and armed with many vile toxins, poisons, and diseases to spread the gifts of Grandfather Nurgle. How you doing, brother? I'm doing well. Hello, nerds. <laughs> I, had to, I had to blend the two somehow. That, no, it's good. <laughs> That's good. I like it. Yeah, I, I have to be Tom by proxy today. That's good. You did a good job. I believed it, uh, <laughs> you know. But Tom is sadly out sick. Uh, he was still thinking he was going to be here for quite a while today. And then that didn't happen. Uh, like, as the hours were getting closer to the show, he got more and more sick and eventually sent me a note. He's like, I've been dry heaving. I don't think I can come to the show. And I was like, are you sure? Like, why don't you <laughs> tell me 30 minutes before? I was really trying to push him because I do find it deeply ironic that we're going to discuss Nurgle and Tom is not here. That's a funny thing to me. Uh, but there we are. That's what's going to happen. Uh, so we're going to go deep dive on the maggot can of Nurgle today. Paul, well, overall, real quick, let's let's give a little little preview uh, of our general opinions. What did you think of the book? Do we have a contender here? Do we have a good book? Were you overall positive on it? I'm very positive on it in general. And not just positive on it from like a competitive sense, because I think we are going to be able to pull some competitive lists out of it. Um, I think there's a lot in here for the people that like open play, the people that like narrative play. Like it's a book that goes in a lot of different directions and can cater to a lot of different people. And like I, I like looking at it, like there's just like some things that I would love to do in like a little bit more of a casual, less competitive game that would just be fun and interesting. Like, you know, run the uh uh, battalion, like whatever the Horticulus Slimex battalion that just can like throw trees all over the board. Like that just seems like a really fun game to play. I don't know how competitive it is, but it would be a really good time. Yeah, I've already seen people discussing how they're going to convert all the trees because like no one's buying all the actual like feculent gnar gnarl maw trees. You know, clearly yeah. everybody will probably get like one or two, but if you're going to like make a bunch of trees, which everybody probably wants the option to do since you can get them out there with your corruption points, which we'll talk about. I've seen so much discussion about like, you know, buying the normal tree packs and how do you convert them and what bits do you use and all that. So I there's it's just, it's just Twitter and Facebook are just going to be like tree conversions for the next <laughs> month. It's just people making trees, just making yeah, I mean trees. Yeah, I mean, if you get one of them, you can just like, you know, trace the uh, base onto like a piece of MDF and then just buy one of the uh, packs of um, the uh, the Sylvaneth Wildwoods. And, you know, yep. that's kind of like just has like three tree bases in it for you and you nurgle it up and bam, you got three for the price of one. Yeah, just hang some like plague bearer torsos or heads or something from there, you know, stuff like that. Maybe carve a little, maybe green stuff, a little smiley face with teeth into it or something. Use some of your extra bits from all the other kits. Since a bunch of like putrid blight kings and and the great unclean and all these things have lots of extra bits, so it's Nurgle is always a bits party. Yeah, so and, and the, there. the fun thing that I discovered, having not really known anything about Nurgle and starting to dig into these boxes, lots of spare random Nurglings everywhere, um, and those guys are just adorable. And they they automatically nurgle up everything. Yep, absolutely. I mean, they bring the fun. They, they do. are they are classically the only part of Nurgle that doesn't disgust me. So I always <laughs> like the I love the little nurglings. I wish every I wish every like chaos god had their own fun little like I don't know uh, mascot like nurglings are right. Um, <laughs> it's why I really loved the Silver Tower with the little mini Lord of Change. You know, that little guy who's like follows around yep. the Gaunt Summoner. Uh, I want to see more of that. But anywho, that's not what we're talking about yet. Let's talk about some news. So we've got some, not a lot. It's yeah. quiet-ish right now, but that's all right. 
Also, uh, it's Tom's job, and he's shirking his responsibilities while he's drive eating. So, as usual, as <laughs> usual, this is the third show you missed, Tom. Three times now. Tell you what, buddy, three strikes. I don't know. I don't. We'll I think after three, like, there's a three strikes rule, and you start looking for a new co-host. Absolutely, absolutely. So, I, I mean, it's entirely possible. Just like, I, I may have to accept, start accepting some resumes or something. We'll, we'll see what happens. But let's look at the rumor engine, shall we? How about we start there? Always All right. to start. So, here you go. It's a rumor engine. It's, it's somebody reading a scroll. Uh, or, actually, I would say with the way it's positioned and the arm is positioned, I think it is someone presenting a scroll, not someone reading a scroll. Do you think the text was blanked out on this side? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it looks like it might have just been whited out. Gotcha. Or like photoshopped out. Because, I mean, it's clearly painted. Yeah, um, up here, yes. Yeah, so, but if you look at the rest of it, it looks like it may have just been, like, erased in Photoshop. So. This does look shockingly smooth. Yes. Like, I feel like GW wouldn't put out, like, like the heavy metal team wouldn't make something that white and smooth. Sure. So the point being is that because you have to think, even if it's the person reading the scroll, like if it's literally turned toward them because they're they're proclaiming it, which would be why the scroll would be turned toward them, right? They'd be like yeah. a town crier or something. It, it makes sense. It would be but, like yellowed and like, you know, have be like splotchy and stuff like that. Yeah, or there'd be something on this side, right? Like yeah. just whatever. Like a seal. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, so I, I think you're exactly correct. I think basically we got a little bit of a rough job of just like they kind of grade all this out. Um, yep. But the I think that what we've got here is another scroll like the uh, like what's his name? The Mr. Scroll Caddy from the Nurgle Army we're going to talk about today. Sorry, all their names aren't locked in my head yet. But Mr. Scroll Herald of Nurgle. Yes where the scroll itself has modeling in it that is indicative of what it is, right? Yeah. Uh, so to me, like, whatever's on here in, as a point of fact is like a modeling that would give the game away, right? Like it'd be some elf symbol or some free guild, you know, Sigmarian symbol or whatever, okay? Yeah, and, and those hands are clearly... I mean, you have like very normal four fingered, like four fingers plus obviously a thumb hidden behind. Uh, so very human or elf or dwarf hand. It doesn't look mutated or anything like that. So probably something, I mean, it, assuming this is an AOS release, it's probably something in order that is humanoid. Yeah, I, I absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, my my sort of initial instinct tells me something LV because the fingers look fairly thin and you know and the hand looks supple. It has that supple design. Plus the hand the arm clearly has a little flourishy roby on. But at the same time, I've got to say it does look like normal human y too, because like I would buy a normal human hand of like an announcer for this. Plus the other thing that leads me away from elves is the scroll handle here is so kind of normal <laughs> yeah does that make sense it's very plain which also to me says probably not uh devoted to sigmar uh because that i feel like some aspect of this would be a little bit more sigmari if if that's what it was like in i and I, it wouldn't be in such like unless they're they're going in a different direction than all of the current uh, devoted of Sigmar stuff like they're not big on like scrolls they're usually just random pieces of paper attached to stuff well that being said I wouldn't buy like it, it could also be a little bit more blunt like a lot of the devoted of Sigmar stuff is rather blunt and what I mean by that is the ends of these two scrolls could just be like big hammers or something right like yeah. so mind-numbingly obvious and then the rest of it's rather simple design the human design tends to be kind of like whack you over the head subtlety isn't the thing right yeah, I mean, it's not free guild because I don't see any pantaloons. Well, you know, I mean, you don't know. This could be that, like, one of the arms on a lot of those types of people is fairly normal, and then the other one is all floofy woofy, right? Yeah. So, could be. 
Uh, I, I think that we're dealing with the left arm here and the rest of the model was photoshopped out, right? Like the angle of this is rather strange. That's that's the only weird yes. part. Yeah, it definitely looks like a left arm. Yep. Um, which, you know, for a lot of people in the Age of Sigmar world that have made some complaints would indicate perhaps he's left-handed and it would make some people happy. I don't know. It, would that be the case? If I, I'm, I'm right-handed, but I would hold, still hold a scroll to read it in my left hand. Like when I hold a book, I hold it in my left hand so I can write with my left or no, or sorry, write with my right. Uh, I think, I think if you're right-handed, you tend to hold things in your offhand, don't you? Like non attacky things. I, I don't know. It depends on what his purpose of the scroll is. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah. Maybe he's attacking with the scroll. I mean, if you were like, Hey, here, read this thing, you horrible person, it would be in your dominant hand. Ah, uh, that's, I see your point. If, if I was like reading shoving it in hand, somebody's face. Sure. No, that's true. If you're like holding it out to be like, I proclaim thee and banish thee demon in the name of Sigmar, gettest thou out of here. Uh, yeah. I would, I would use my right hand. Just not even thinking about it. I held up my right hand doing that. But yeah. if I was like, I was going to read it, I just naturally use my left. Huh? Interesting. Yes. I, I mean, it's not reading... interesting, but like, I'm really interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are reading like way more into this than I think we are really meant to. Um, see what I did there about reading things. Um, All right, uh, so final guess. What is this? So we wasted so much time on handedness. Um, final guess is yep. um, all of this gets thrown in the trash because it's something for forty k. <laughs> Absolutely. There you go. No, I, I'm. I'm going to say I think this is definitely AOS. And I am going to swing and say, this is the long awaited devoted release. We're going to get some order humans. There you go. There you go. I, we know. Oh, go ahead. I'd be happy about that. Yeah. I mean, we know that they said that they've been trying to work on the humans, right? But the human, they, they, they were very blunt in several talks about the fact that humans were more challenging because yeah. They wanted to make them interesting and have a, their own unique aesthetic and, you know, feel like they're part of the mortal realms and not just a straight port of what was before. I'm sympathetic to that. I understand. So, yep. uh, but they know they've said that, you know, he's, he, he said, if you like that type of stuff, you'd be excited in the next year or two. Okay, great. Well, I like that type of stuff. So let's see it. There you go. So I'm going to say little scribey proclaimer town crier of the devoted of Sigmar who's walking around shouting out uh you know i don't know like holy words or something like that you know that kind of guy hmm. there you go yeah i think that's definitely possible um, hey i would dig a devoted release i would have since the beginning since i oh since i cracked the first age of sigmar book and saw stormcast next to like some witch hunters and uh warrior priests and a hurricane i was like well i like where this is i like that yeah so, there you go yeah yeah and i am still uh i'm holding out uh, every time i see a little thing about humans somewhere in there like the uh uh the new stormcast guy has some fluff about like leading humans i'm like he's gonna have some keyword or some ability that's got to do with free guild it's got to be like it's in Someone. the fluff he's gonna, just, just give me one model with a rule that has <laughs> something to do with free guild all right <laughs> i like that we saw that picture and it only took two and a half years to make that a reality on like your sort of match play table so that's not too bad it's pretty good pretty good turnaround really yeah. uh all I right mean, for GW, that's extraordinary turnaround <laughs> absolutely so uh we had some other news uh heat yes. one was obviously last weekend uh the order list the mixed order list again at the top uh, so the the menagerie. Uh, what did you think of that? Seeing that come in tops again in Heat One. Big big list. A lot of interesting results in there. Yeah, it, it, I thought it was very interesting. I haven't had a chance to really crunch the numbers on it. Like I uh, on Masters, I actually like crunched the numbers on the lists and uh, really dove into that. But there's a lot more lists in uh, Heat One, so uh, I haven't really had a chance to dig into it yet. But I did notice like that one list at the top and like that list in a lot of ways breaks all the rules that we conventionally think of for what should be a good competitive AOS list. Like it doesn't have low drops. It doesn't have uh, 
any battalions. It doesn't have like it, it's not in a particular uh, faction. It's just a grand alliance. Um, it's just a bunch of little combos of things that work really well together. Yep. Um, it, it, it like you look at the list and you're like, oh, well, I mean, against like KO, like this should just get blown off the table turn one before anything important even happens. But I mean, obviously it made it through that gauntlet for six rounds. So and there were yeah, two I think it's awesome. near the top. Well, there were two, hold on now. There were two bone splitters near the top, but the oh. number like second and fourth. Yeah. The number four wasn't running, wasn't using cut and rock. He really? was using the other battalion. Yeah, he was using the like the bone split a uh, sort of like pseudo murder host uh, battalion, which you'll have to excuse me for not remembering what its name is. But it's the one that lets you gives you all the extra free movement to get across the table, like turn one, the you know murder host style. So uh, I, which I do not remember because I have not internalized all the ridiculous bone split of battalions. Um, the the second place guy was using cut and rock. Yes. So uh, it was interesting. There was a there was a death you know, up there in like the top 10 ish. Uh, so, you know, that was good to see. Good to see that yeah. death wasn't completely missing uh, again. Yeah. And uh, performing I, pretty well. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, that's a heat one's like a, that's a big tournament. There's a lot of people playing. So if you're in like the top 10 ish, you did really well, right? Uh, yeah. Let's not kid ourselves here. Um, the interesting thing to me, I love the fact that the top four, you know, was basically a generic order and two bone splitters. I would have never, you could have given me 10 guesses, Vegas odds makers. That would not have been my, you know, three out of my top four. Not even close. And the other one was a murder host, right? Yeah. Yes. The other one was a murder host. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Which, uh, murder host just annoys the shit out of me. Like it just bothers me <laughs> that that list is good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no issue with it. I love it as a list. I'm glad it's around. I'm glad there's something that, and, and I'm glad it's in Korn's hands. If there's any army that should be yes. doing that, honestly, it should be Korn. They're the psychotic, bloodthirsty lunatics who should scream across the table. It's it's good that that exists because it makes you account for a list like that. Yes. And yeah. I think that that does good things to the game because if you know you've always can just kind of sit back and always, it puts more pressure on like shooty armies and stuff like that. Like, which can also have bad effects on the meta, right? Like if the meta gets overtly filled with castle and shooty armies and stuff like that, that can become bad. So these kind of lists put a lot of pressure on them. It's a little rock to that scissors and so on and so forth. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, in, it just sort of as a side note, just my observation of all of the, like the top competitive lists that have been coming out for, uh, out of these big GTs and the masters and all of that, um, it seems like there's a nice rock, paper, scissors game going on with these top lists, even just kind of, you know, like theory hammering them. Like there's no one list that just seems to be good against everything. Right. And right. It, it, and like, you know, it, the list that uh, was what Byron again, piloting this list. Yeah. The order list. Yes. Yes. And he brought that to masters and he did not do nearly as well with it because his matchups were different. Yeah. No, it's it's a really good point. Like obviously in a big tournament like that, it's very matchup dependent. A lot of these things are and I talked about this with Tom, um, because he was he's looking at his lists for you know, uh for Holy Wars and for Adepticon and stuff like that and figuring out what he wants to play. And what he keeps coming to is he's like, Well, this is really good against these, but if I run into this, it's gonna be a harder fight. But if I make this switch, then I then you know, da 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 and I'm like, stop. Except that there is no perfect list. You're not gonna yeah. find the one that like cracks the whole field, man. You're just going to have to play your best and sometimes be on the back foot. Yeah. That's it. Which, which I think is the moral of the story that I've been really coming up with uh, tooling around with Nurgle lists is that they, it's really solid against a lot of different things. And there's a couple of things that are, you know, you're just not going to do so well against. And right. um, maybe accepting those things, understanding that you're probably going to lose those matchups will give you more flexibility in your choices for other matchups. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's see. What else we got? Oh, uh, so, so we had some new malign portents stories. Uh, one of them was absolutely disgusting, and after I read it, I wished I didn't read it. I still feel <laughs> sick to my stomach uh, like three days later. 
So that's fun. Uh, yeah. But the question with that story is, have you heard about our Lord and Savior, Nagash? Have you heard <laughs> the good news of Nagash? Yeah, yeah. Have, have you heard that uh, Sigmar has forsaken this realm and Nagash is here to save us? Uh -huh. Huh? <laughs> I love the, like, sort of the, the proselytizing Nagash vampire uh, woman. Who like I read her as a vampire in the story. I don't I don't know that she specifically was. She could have been any sort of thing. Um, yes. They never outright call her a vampire. They just say she's like a very pale, cold woman, which I traditionally read as one of the the vampire sort of uh, girls in that army. But whatever. Or could be a witch elf. Could be several different things. Um, yeah, there's no reason it couldn't have been an elf. By the way, they never address her race. They just say woman. Doesn't necessarily mean human woman. Uh, but whatever the case. Um, the yeah i love that she shows up and she's like look it's all good let me tell you about nagash he's got what you're looking for see all this this is all crap just let it go it's a bag of bricks why are you carrying it around just let that bag of bricks go right and and i love that the also i love the sly sister of sigmar sneaking back in from from ancient times from mordheim i'm glad to see that is preserved but of course, the sister of Sigmar immediately is like, yeah, I'm in for this. Let's go. What is this? Nagash? All right, I'm in. What do we got to do here? Is there like a yeah. form to fill out or what? what's the what's the deal here? Yeah, I haven't really been keeping that up on what's going on with those stories, but I did kind of skim that one. And I was like, oh, like this is taking the story in an interesting direction. I'm intrigued. Yeah, I love it because if you look at sort of the arc of the stories and this Doom and Darkness pointed this out and, and I agreed with it. I was in the, of the same mind. The last couple stories, one of them framed the Stormcast as the villain, as the monster in the darkness yeah. who was coming, right? And one of the next ones framed Nagash as the savior and the hero, right? And the key is who are your point of view characters? In both cases, your point of view characters are the normal people who live in this realm. Right? Yes. Yeah. And uh, there was something uh, in some of the fluff somewhere before this that basically they, that Sigmar had just kind of considered the Stormcast to be so dangerous that he didn't ever let them anywhere near normal people. Like the humans, the elves, the dwarves, like... Like they like you had like the the cities being defended by like those races because if the stormcast got anywhere near them to defend them against chaos, I mean they'd end up accidentally tear tearing the whole city down. Yeah, so I I love it. I love the way it's framing that. I think that's a fantastic and interesting little narrative turn. I want to see certainly more of that. Uh, yes. Or, uh, so I more more of that good good story so far. I want to watch yeah. this unfold. And it, it's leaving some great space for one of my favorite character archetypes. Is a, we have some space for a nice anti-hero to come in. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the fact that we've got a rumor that we've got a big errata coming soon. You mentioned this offhand in one of your videos. I thought this would be good because obviously yeah. there's we. The big, the, the big rumor circulating is we're going to get a big errata pretty soon, which would make sense on sort of the schedule. If you look at like the 40K errata schedule that they laid out, we would be due. The rumor floating around is we're going to get one. And, uh, you know, rumors is that Vanguard Wing is going to be out uh, yeah. and, and some other probably corrections. Uh, I am personally happy to see that. I always like this sort of thing. It's good. Keep it on a regular schedule. Um, I have no issue with it. It's fine. So yeah, I'm, I mean, Vanguard wing I've been playing, but uh, it is a cheap enough army to build that I am not upset if it gets eroded out and I'm going to end up using most of those models for other things anyway. So, I mean, okay, sucks. A list doesn't work the way it used to. And we don't know how badly it will get nerfed. It may still be useful and just, you know, have to be nine inches away or something like that. Um, and you just have to tweak it, but. Yeah, I mean, exactly. The chance that Stormcast are suddenly going to be not good at all seems slim. Slim. Yeah. I don't think they need only that battalion to thrive. So, you know. 
Yeah, and, and you know, it, and the video that I well, I recorded it yesterday, so in my head it was yesterday, but I actually put it up this morning. Um, about you know charges and re rolls and casting spells and all of that stuff, like Gavriel with a plus three to charge and the uh, Knight Vexilor letting you re-roll charges, like those two things together make those like lightning strikes nine inches away, like a 92% average charge success. So, yep. I mean, all we're doing is changing list composition. We're not really changing. We're going to get in your face turn one. Right. And the, the real critical key with that is they clearly made Gavriel with the idea that, people that you would move him into a position and then like lightning strike or, or drop people or chariot people to him because yeah. hit the extra, the extra movement in the charge is triggered based on being near him at the charge phase, not on being yeah. around him when he activates the ability. Right. So yeah. if the fact that they're up in the heavens means nothing, he can just sit there and turn that ability on. And as long as he's walking around, he's just projecting that like Diablo two paladin aura uh, yeah. of charging. So, yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's it's good. I, I'll be interested. I'm. I hope they do break it pretty strongly. Uh, just so because I, I hate whenever one thing in a very vast and diverse army, which Stormcast certainly is, becomes ultra dominant. It just becomes boring. It turns. It, it takes the whole faction and puts it through like a magnifying glass down into a single point of light. Um, yep. I would like to see people and people stop exploring as much. Like there are other good lists in there. And people aren't yeah. bothering to look for them because there's already the, the road more traveled, right? So there you go. Yeah. And, and I think if we, all it's going to take is a relatively small shift in the overall metagame. And I think a sort of like balanced Stormcast list could be very, very good. Yeah. You know, like it, it, to make an analogy, like, what we're missing right now, I think, in the metagame in general is, like, the equivalent of, like, what Jund is in Magic. Like, yep. that sort of, like, mid-rangey, all-comers sort of thing that has the ability to change gears depending on what you're playing against. And um, I feel like a lot of the dominant lists right now in the competitive metagame are very like one dimensional in what they actually do. Um, so I'd really like to see just enough of a shift where, you know, like that, that other thing that is just a little bit of everything can really shine. Yep. Absolutely. All right. One last piece of news I wanted to touch on. It's not directly related to AOS, but it sort of is and sort of isn't. It kind of connects into Nurgle, which we're talking about. So obviously next week we're getting all the Custodes stuff, uh, or, or as I like to call them, Stormcast in space. And the only reason I bring them up is because uh, all of the heroes for that army, exempting the named dude, um, convert out of one member of the kit. Right. Like that is to say any of the kits can also create the hero of that type. So if you want like the hero wearing Terminator armor, you can do that. Or the guy on the jet bike, you can do that. So you can make your characters out of the normal guys. And uh, and and in most cases, that's you're not actually losing out on that too bad. Unlike the so this is also this also happened with the Lord of Afflictions and the like Puscoil yeah. dudes. Right. The problem with the Puscoil dudes is that you need them in twos. So like necessarily, yeah. <laughs> you now have this extra odd guy. Um, so whereas with like the Terminators, you get them in the box in a bigger number than their min unit size. So like making one into a character, you don't actually lose anything uh, or well, you know what I mean? Um, my question is this, Paul, looking into the future, is this the new way? Like, we're still going to see clan pack characters to some degree or another. There always will be individual characters, I suppose. But is this a way forward? Are we going to start seeing, when we're talking about, like, non-special characters, like non-Gavriels and, you know, very special dudes, um, your your Slavity Bile Pipers or whatnot, if we're just talking about hero versions of, let's say, a, something that's pretty close to a version of the army, are we just going to start seeing them come in the kit? Uh, as as an option, I think some number of them will. Um, 
it, they seem to like it. They seem to be sort of piloting it. They, I think the first kits they did that with were the um, Flesh Eater Quartz, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, I think, and I think that was almost a, a situation of necessity, right? Because yeah. they they had these characters that they had created more or less on paper, and they were like, well, we're not going to recast for this, right? Instead, right. they're like, oh, if these things are just a special ghoul, why not just tell them, make a special ghoul? Right, because they look like everything else, just they need to look kind of different, right? right? These guys are are a, another. They're sort of the next step in that progression to me, right? Um, where they're actually including bits in that box specific to make that character, right? It was really the intention. Like in the Cryptor box, they were just like, "Oh, hey, you can make one of these guys. Just make him look special," <laughs> right? Yeah. Whereas this is like we put an extra sprue in there to make this dude. Yeah, what I would hope is that if they are going to continue along that path, then in AOS, I hope we go back in like the next GHB to individual model pricing so that uh, you don't end up with those random spare extra one dudes that you can slip them into a unit and it makes sense and it works. Um, yeah, I mean, I would have to say, I hope to God we don't do that, but that's all right. Uh, I definitely don't want that. Uh, yeah. but, <laughs> but I mean, then me. your other option is like, okay, then if I want the hero and I want some of the dudes, then I buy two packs, build two of the heroes, sell one on eBay and make two regular dudes. Yeah. My hope would be, they'd be, you know, smart with it. I think we, I think we'll see this to some degree. It's not like it's going to replace individual characters. Like I said, um, I mean, to me, I think this is a thing they're going to do whenever they can to basically keep costs down and still make new characters. Right. Um, I think yeah. that's more or less what it is. And, and that makes sense. Um, but if it's like anything that really stands apart, like I said, like Slavity, right. That, that dude's just going to be his own thing. You know what I mean? Because he is what he is. It's not yeah. like they're going to say, stop designing interesting, unique characters. No, no. Yeah. And I'm curious. So I'm going to look something up real quick on the sure. Games Workshop website. But um, uh, my thought is actually on the pricing of these guys. And we're all waiting for what Paul is researching. Yeah. Yes. So. So here's my thought, right, is yep. um, we had this similar option out of the uh, Dracothian Guard kit as well. And then we also have the Vandis Hammerhand kit. Sure. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, to that point, that, like, I, I saw Veilotron, I saw you mention that too. I mean, yes, that is true, although that model existed individually before there was a Dracothian Guard, right? Like... Yeah. As part of the big box set and then eventually kind of afterward, but whatever. Yes. But yeah, I, I guess my uh, the point I was getting at is the if you were going for individual model, uh, the price point on Vandis is $40 retail and the price point on the Dracothian Guard is 65 retail. So, I mean, you're not, you're paying more but I feel like they're like on average. I mean, you're you're probably it, it's like it, they're not like really ridiculously gouging you by doing that because if you were to just buy the single model, it was going to be like you know seventy five percent of the price of the double kit. So it it makes me not as concerned about it price wise. Yeah. I'm just interested to see where they apply it more than anything. When they did it for so many of the custodes type of guys, I thought, huh, I wonder where we'll see that happen more. So that's just something interesting that occurred to me that I want to watch. I think it'll be interesting to see uh, where they like deploy this. Um, and I think in a lot of cases, you actually can sort of scratch build in one of the guys you need, depending on the kit. Like I could see situations where you could do that. So we'll see. Yeah, And, and there's always... You know, from a realistic perspective, um, you know, I'm sure not the thing that GW wants to hear us say, but I mean, you can go on bit sites yeah. 
and convert stuff. You can do all kinds of things. I mean, I'm sure you can go on a bit site, buy a, uh, a single plague drone body without the rider for a pretty cheap price. And then throw that together and then put some converted hero on top of it that you also get off of bits or from spare bits you have lying around and, you know, convert that, whatever the Pascoil guy is. The Lord yeah, of yeah. Is yeah, what his name? Afflictions. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It, I mean, you can easily convert him if you choose to do so. Yeah, I mean, the reality is I'd, I'd much rather, like, I can pick up, if my choice is to be buy a $40 individual hero or go on a bit site and pick up a torso and a pair of legs or something or whatever I happen to be missing, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get the torso and the pair of legs cheaper or whatever it happens to be. In many cases, I'm sure somebody can present me an, uh, a counter argument. I'm not making an all-inclusive statement. I'm saying most of the time that's true. Anywho, uh, let's talk about some pick of the week. So yeah. what do you got, man? What do you want to share with everybody? Some pick of the week. Um, you know, that is a good question. Um, you know, one that I don't think anybody has uh, really been, I don't, I don't think I've heard on the pick of the week yet is uh, a relatively new or at least new to me channel. Uh, Kitetsu um is doing some really good coverage of all of the malign important stuff like doing really nice little summaries of each one of them um which i love because i'm not the kind of person that's going to sit there and read each one of these malign important short stories if you can give me the quick and dirty 10 minute audio summary of them that it makes me really happy um and he's been doing a really nice job with those um and his other stuff in general is like really high quality content um so definitely go check him out if he's not already on your sub list. Yeah, indeed. I, I, uh, I'm very familiar that dude's been, he's, he's racking up the views. He's, he's hit the, like, he's rolling them trends. He's doing a good job yeah. of like every time he's like hitting the, he's using the, he's following the like 10 things you missed, uh, yes. thing on YouTube very well. So, uh, there you go. No, I agree. Uh, to that same line, uh, I'll talk about uh, everybody should check out if you haven't already. Two plus tough, uh, we're gonna have him on the show soon. Um, he did some recent videos on lore of several characters in the Nurgle army, so well in line with what we're talking about. He does one on great unclean ones and Rotigus, uh, just recently, and he did uh, one on the Glotkin on the brothers Glot, uh, before that. So, uh, both of the all, all of that is very worth checking out. Uh, so I'll link out to his recent videos as well. Okay. Uh, let's talk about some hobby time, man. What have you been working on? You've been painting a lot of stuff. Yeah, I've got to say, um, I actually started cracking into my Nurgle stuff. Um, and I have not been this enthusiastic and motivated to paint things in a really, really long time. Um, and... I, I, I think it's because, you know, I started with Free Guild, then I went to Corn, mostly Bloodbound, and then I went to Stormcast, and those are all basically humans in armor. So it's like uh, skin and metal, armor, some cloth, and wash, rinse, repeat over and over and over again, and same color schemes over and over again. Now Nurgle's here, it's like all weird, different flesh colors, totally different color palette, totally different painting techniques. Um, it's just like a really nice, like refresh for me that's like gotten me more excited about painting again, which has been pretty awesome. Um, and also uh, I started, well, I started finishing my Stormcast. Um, and actually, they're actually coming out. They're not quite done yet because they are still missing heads, but my, uh, Dracothian guard with a little bit of conversion going on, actually putting a little extra try hard into making them look good. Um, using some uh, different techniques and stuff for them. So um, that's been fun too. So actually I, I'm reinvigorated to paint stuff, which is good. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. Nurgle's a fun style to paint. Like it can, it, it 
is often somewhat zen about it because you can just kind of go crazy. You can truly live the Bob Ross lifestyle with it, right? Like, yeah, there are no mistakes in Nurgle. <laughs> yeah. There's no mistakes at all. <laughs> right. It's it's just there are only happy accidents granted by the Plague Father. So that's nice. Yeah. Like, oh, the, you you. you you uh, put too much wash on. Oh, that that's that's a boil now. That's what happens. So be it. <laughs> so be it. Uh, so uh, the for myself, uh, I'm working on my uh, on my night titan still. Uh, this week has been very productive. I feel really good about what I've accomplished. Um, what I've accomplished is sitting on a piece of paper in front of me, and it is the free hand on the armor plates. Um, so I'll hold this up though. I don't think it's going to show to any reasonable degree. Um, so if that, I don't know if that comes out or not. Um, oh, it looks really awesome. So this is obviously one of the shoulders. This is the less time consuming shoulder, um, <laughs> by far. Um, the, I'm about, I'll be very conservative and say I'm about 40 hours into the free hand, uh, on this, not the model, the free hand. <laughs> okay. And uh, I think that I might do, I would love some feedback on this if people are interested in this. Um, for a hobby cheating, I've already talked about doing things like damage, and I did a lot of things last time I did my Night Titan. Um, but I think I was thinking about doing an inspirational hobby cheating about painting bravely. Um, one of the most common things I hear people talk about is, I was afraid to screw something up. I hear people say that a lot. I don't know what that means. Um, I, I'm being facetious to some degree. I mean, I know what they mean, but <clears throat> like the next thing I'm going to do with this, which to be very clear, like all of this and getting this to be as like perfect as I could is probably this shoulder right here is again, will be very conservative and say six hours of work. Okay. And I'm going to take this and battle damage this. Like I'm going to put paint over top of it. I'm going to scratch it. I'm going to put oil washes over it for weathering. I'm going to rust stuff. And I obviously don't have like the gold and, uh, and all that stuff done yet either. Right. Um, so I'm going to screw it up intentionally. Um, and so I thought about whether or not people would be interested in. Uh, no, it wasn't. Oh, somebody asked 40 hours for that shoulder pad. No, no. 40 hours for the free hand across the, the model. Um, <clears throat> the uh, of whether or not people would feel it interesting to hear me talk about why I believe in like paint bravely and why I believe you can't make mistakes and why I believe you've got to try stuff. So I'd love some feedback. You can throw in the comments now or down below um, on whether or not people feel that would be a valuable hobby cheating. Um, I'm not, wouldn't be showing any technique. I'd just be trying to impart to you my thoughts about why you have to, why you, you shouldn't be afraid, why you should live that Bob Ross lifestyle. Um, so there you go. Uh, but that's what I've been working on. I'm hopeful to be done with this by next weekend. That's my goal. Uh, if I can finish it in another by, you know, basically next, the uh, next sort of Sunday, not this coming Sunday, but the one after that, I'll feel pretty good. And I think I can reach that. Um, I knew this, this girl would be like a, like a month long project at least. So, uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, so that's what I've been working on. So uh, if I can, just add something in. Something I, I, I've been meaning to throw out there for a while. Feel free to say I'm crazy. I'm a jerk for even bringing it up. Uh -huh. Disregard if you like. But it, it, a challenge slash request for you regarding the hobby cheating. Yeah, man. Hit me. And, and based on questions I've asked before, you probably know what's coming. Okay. Um, I would really, and it, I have... Uh, a fairly good rationale for this as well. Um, I would really like to see you do a hobby cheating and do a horde army. And I know you are opposed to horde armies in general, don't like painting them. Um, but there's a lot of armies out there that require lots of models mm -hmm. and a lot, they're popular. A lot of people play them. And um, there's not a lot out there that I've seen short of like the, uh, like the just do it videos or whatever that, uh, doom and darkness was doing for a while, um, that kind of give you guidance on 
how to do that. And I know you've mentioned too that you haven't actually painted a horde army in a long time. So maybe that could be a nice little little personal challenge, change things up for you a little bit. Um, <laughs> I feel free to shoot that down because I know that is probably like hundreds of hours of work to get that to like where you want it to be. And there's probably not even an army you don't currently own that you would want to do that with. Um, but it's just a thought. It's just a thought that I had. I thought it would be really cool. Um, I know personally from uh, my own uh, unfortunate hobby projects, I would love to have some advice on how to do that and watch uh, someone with the expertise such as yourself to actually undertake that. Um, and What would you want to see with it? Like um, how I approach a big unit. Like if I'm talking about a horde army and I'm looking at a unit of, I want to do 40 or 50 or 60 guys. How do I make that as fast to a highest quality as possible? Is that what you're talking about? Or yeah, like, how do I break down the whole army or, or what, what, like what exactly are you looking for? I, I would say, you know, maybe even do like a little series on it where you kind of break down all those different pieces, like how to tie it all together. Um, you know, the little things that are, you know, you can paint something relatively quickly, but if you do these few little things like the faces, bases, banners, and shields, like how to do that stuff to make uh, models in a big unit kind of pop a little bit, um, those sorts of things that um, will help people field an army full of tons of dudes that, you know, it that has... Uh, a pretty decent painting standard to it because there's a, an unfortunate number of them that are like, you know, kind of like base wash complete that end up happening, you know? Yep. Um, there, I mean, there's a lot of fire slayers out there that got, you know, orange mohawks and, you know, uh, fleshy skin and loincloths and then flesh shade over them and they were done. Um, so. Okay. I'll think about it. We'll see what we'll see what comes out this year. I will add it to the list. I will say that. Um, I don't. I saw a lot of people asking for me to do this with Skaven in the chat. Um, I don't. You already own a bazillion Skaven. So like, I don't know that I have a unit of Skaven that I would even do this with. Like, I already own fifty Storm Vermin, one hundred and fifty Clan Rats, fifty Plague Monks. Like, I don't. I know that's not enough Plague Monks, but I don't run Pestilence ever. Um, I'm disappointed that it's only 150 clan rats. Sorry. Those are some rookie numbers, Vince. Get those numbers up. <laughs> it was my standard three blocks of 50 in 8th edition. Like, I think where they were slaves, I mean, in 8th in edition. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Because, all I, I mean, I, I un unashamedly were just ran the, the Skaven and AZ list throughout all of 8th, which is like, you know, three blocks of 50 slaves, block of 40 Storm V, and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll take a look. Uh, you know, depending on the armies we get released this year, um, and what they look like, there could definitely be some opportunities for that. Uh, yeah. you know, if they end up releasing some kind of Slanesh thing, Slanesh elf thing, depending on how that looks, um, that could end up having very big units and, and provide a nice opportunity for that. And if there was to be a Slanesh, Slanesh elf thing, I would buy all of that. I would buy all of it. Like, yeah, all of it. So, all of it. Um, somebody said paint 120 skinks. I could paint 120 skinks before the end of this show. Um, that's like, that is truly one of the easy, those things are some of the easiest paint jobs in the universe. Uh, joking and, and aside, I, like really I could have thrown you a worse challenge and just challenged you to paint a Nurgle army. <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> no, like, then that's part of the challenge with this. It's like, the, the models and what we're talking about are, do change the, the sort of way you think about this. Like, um, if I were going to do a whole, these, this isn't a horde army, but I'm just using it as a counterpoint. If I were going to do a whole army of, say, you know, something like Stormcast, where they're very uniform in color and, and use metallics, it's a very different set of techniques I would bring to bear than if I were doing something like Skinks or Skaven or something like that. You know, the more detail and nonsense and different materials that are packed onto a model, the more sort of you have to vary the way that you're applying these techniques. What makes skinks easy is that they're uniformly basically one thing. And by that, I mean like they're naked lizards holding a spear and a shield. So like they, the vast majority of them, a skink and a storm cast on a speed paint are roughly the same effort. 
right? Like size that doesn't yeah. matter because they're both the same basic principle. Um, they're a uniform color with slight variation for little, a few little details. But anyway, okay. I'll, uh, I'll, I will add that to the list. And if the opportunity arises, I would love to do that video. I really would. Um, because I think hordes do break a lot of people and they shouldn't. Um, you, you really can. There's lots of good techniques to make them faster. Okay. All right. Right on. So we've, we've, we've made people wait long enough. Nurgle time. I'm, I'm literally adding this to the list right now, by the way. I'm, I'm <laughs> Because I, I keep a list on my computer of all all requests. So it is in the list. It has been saved and added to the list. There you go. Okay. Fabulous. Um, so the let's talk about Nurgle. So we mentioned overall, I like the book too. Um, I like okay, I hate Nurgle. We all get that. All right, neat. Let's move on. Um, so overall reading the book, what I will say is um I really like the look of this book. Um, can I make a reference to just before we get into any of the stats, which is and and rules and stuff, which is you know really what we're here to cover? Um, yep. Can I just say that I actually really like a lot of the stuff that's in this book? Um, there were some awesome tutorials on doing like gray skin, green skin, rust, lots of different interesting types of armor, like painting them. The heavy metal section was really good. What I particularly loved was you know how they do the like. Um, the I don't I don't remember what the sections of call section is called, but it's like the the different groupings, the the armies of blah blah blah, right? And they kind of show you the color schemes. Normally, they they had done those in the past, um, like in the Zinch book and in the Stormcast book. They kind of did them in like that, you know, two D like guy standing there like this thing where they just have the basic colors. Here, they actually did like a nice piece of art for each of them, which I thought looked really cool, right? So they've got like the Munificent Wanderers and uh, the Befouling Host. And like, then they actually have a picture of what like a plague bearer in that force would look like, as well as like the unique symbol of that, uh, of that group. I thought that was really cool. It actually reminded me of the, um, the End Times books, where they had like the forces that were arrayed in those particular battles, like the units, you know, it was like the bronze balls, like, you know, these hand gunners who were really good and stuff, which by the way is the one I remember. Cause that's an amazing name. Um, so uh, the, but the, I thought these were really cool and they gave you, they were really nice ideas for sort of color schemes and stuff. So on the whole, I really liked the way the book is laid out. I thought the art was really good. Um, just all the little stuff is clear that they're just, sharpening their knife and getting really good at making these books inspire you to enjoy the army, right? Yes, definitely. Uh, interesting thing that was actually absent from the book uh, that I'm curious what your thoughts are on. Um, okay. The rules weren't in the book. What's what? The rules were not in the book. The Like the core rule set, the four pages? Oh, yeah, they left them out of the last couple. They haven't been in the last couple, so. Yeah, I, I mean, I somebody else just made that observation to me today, and I was like, huh, that's weird. Um, I mean, they have left them out of the last couple. I mean, it could easily be, like, a printing thing. It could be, uh, you can just get this online, so why are we wasting paper on it thing? I, I don't know. It, it could also indicate that we have some sort of tweak to the core rules coming. Could be. I mean, at the same time, that was what was thought originally. And now here we are like a GHB and several things later. I just don't think they're going to change anything like that, that big. I mean, maybe they will. I mean, eventually they will, but like anytime soon, my suspicion is <coughs> there was sort of a bean counter move where somebody was like, okay, we make X number of books. If we don't print those four pages times X number of books, we save, you know, six cents per book times, whatever and they were like great there's there's you know whatever thousands of dollars in savings neat you know yeah and wasn't there something that you had talked about with uh like certain page numbers of like for printing being better than others and cheaper and easier to print yeah yes yeah it, so it could very easily have something to do with that it could have absolutely no meaning to anything other than like logistics and accounting for the the books getting printed but right it it was a conspicuous absence. Sure. I mean, as per usual, as with everything GW, you know, we read the tea leaves pretty closely, right? 
Um, yeah. And those tea leaves do not mean anything ever. <laughs> <laughs> but they keep us guessing. So, they do. <laughs> and I like that. So, so let's, let's kind of start at the high level. Um, do you want to describe the sort of core allegiance abilities of a Nurgle army? Like, do you want to describe the, the cycle of corruption, uh, kind of how that works? We don't need to go through every item on the wheel or whatever, but like, yeah. you know, kind of how that works. And then the, uh, contagion points, that kind of thing. Yes. Uh, so basically the cycle of corruption, uh, instead of having just like one command ability or uh, one battle trait, we basically have seven. Uh, and you roll a d6 at the start of each game to determine where on the cycle of corruption you begin. Uh, one of the cy the uh, cycles is, you know, like doesn't have a number associated with it. So you can't actually start there. Uh, so you get one of the other six. Um, and it moves forward one each battle round. Um, and if you happen to be playing Nurgle versus Nurgle, you both share the same wheel, which is kind of interesting. Um, and they are a collection of um, basically some relatively minor buffs and debuffs that are pretty much army-wide. Uh, we've got uh, some that... Uh, buff you your guys some that debuff your opponent's guys uh some that do damage some that heal uh one that do, uh, may damage your opponent and may heal you um so it's a little uh menagerie if you will of uh different relatively minor abilities um and, they do uh, apply across the whole army. That's what's relevant about it, right? Yeah. That, that, the, the very relevant thing is that it applies across the whole mm -hmm. army and your opponent's whole army. Um, or, you know, it, and the, the, the three that are like one-time effects um, are, you know, potentially like army-wide type abilities. Yep. So, Did it, you have it, a particular it, favorite it, from the list? Um, what I really like about the list overall and what like what i love about this in general is that each one of these is very situationally good um you know it one will buff your movement one will uh buff your to wound in the combat phase so all of your guys hit harder um you can rain damage on your opponent you can heal your guys you can uh, make your enemy re-roll sixes in the combat phase. You can make them re-roll battle shock tests of one. Um, so there's there's a little bit of something for whatever you need. Um, and you have uh, a spell that all Nurgle wizards know that let you reset the dial to wherever you want it to be. Um, and you also have a command trait that will let you uh, tick the wheel either up or back one at the start of uh, your hero phase. So it, you have ways to manipulate the wheel uh, to get the things that you want. And, you know, it, they're all like different boons that are, they're useful in certain circumstances. So... I like that it is very tactically flexible. And at the same time, they're not like back breaking things that are just like crazy windmill slam, like, aha, I win. Right. Um, they're like just enough to be worthwhile, but not game breaking. Sure. <clears throat> Did, yeah, what I found interesting about him is a couple things. So, um, Obviously, to me, like the standouts are things like the, you know, army wide move buff or the army wide wound buff are, you know, both obviously pretty good, um, right. depending on where you are in the game. But what I found interesting are things like three of them out of the seven are specifically pinned to the start of your hero phase, right? Yes. So you can't use your sort of wheel manipulation spell to get to those and do anything. I mean, like, if you pick them, all you're going to do is set what happens next turn, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because we've skipped the part of the phase that would trigger them. Um, 
So that's really interesting to me. Whereas, but you know, I, I get the sneaking suspicion that most of the time I wouldn't be picking those anyways. And they actually placed them rather interestingly to where I can, they're, they're usually after something else I would want to roll into those. Yes. So I think this is actually a quite well-designed thing. Like, so for example, the burgeoning, which is one of my favorites, which basically says, you know, you roll a die for every for every unit within an inch of a terrain feature okay at the start of your hero phase and uh mm -hmm. like on a five or more the unit suffers a mortal wound and neural units instead heal a wound i quite like that one um as a as a thing to roll into from the vigor which is the one before the one i would probably set it to you know during an active turn where i'd say okay i want to add one to the wound rolls um, of all attacks made by Nurgle units in the combat phase. And then during my next turn, I, if I didn't get the knee, if I didn't get the spell off and it just rolled to step three, I would still feel pretty good about that. Right. Um, because sure. there's good AOS tables have a lot of terrain. And so like, there's going to be a lot of units that you're just splashing mortal wounds around on. Right. Like, is it again, as you said, is it game breaking? No, no, but splashing around an extra couple mortal wounds or five mortal wounds or whatever, you know, depending on how many units there are and how many terrain features there are. Seems good to me. Like again, free mortal wounds aren't bad. So, yeah. Um, and a lot of these things are set up so that they are not like, I haven't found any crazy combos. Let me put it that way with the wheel plus something else in the army. It looks like it had a lot of very intentional design. So you can't set the wheel to a particular thing that compos with something else that uh, does a crazy ability. Like it, like that combo just doesn't seem to exist. Um, yeah, I mean, I would agree to a degree. There's no like direct sort of one-to-one. -one. I will say that like with the right manipulation, you could easily have like first turn charging Blight Kings. Um, right. So you like, you can go, it's again, This that's just one component of it. It's not like it alone is what gets you there. It doesn't alone turn your beer black kings into a murder host. Um, it's more of like a contributor. As with everything, these are more contributory factors, right? Not they don't stand alone as like this is the win. Right. So, um, all right. But like I, I think that the thing that stands out for me is that the close combat buff is plus one to wound, and all of the abilities in Nurgle that are like like some sort of like exploding attack. Or, you know, do like the Blight Kings, they're doing extra attacks when you hit on a six. Right. The uh, Blades of Putrefaction does mortal wounds when you hit on a six. So you can't use the wheel to buff yourself into a better, like, exploding wound ability. Right. It's right. just ticking up your ability to do normal damage. Yep. Uh, Which, so obviously, the other items. Uh, so, so we don't stick totally on the wheel is you get a tree. <laughs> yep. Okay. You get a tree. Happy little tree. Yep. Everybody um, gets a tree. So if you're yeah, playing Nurgle, um, everybody's got to buy one tree, at least one tree. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's an interesting one that I'm not like, I'm not sure how I feel about the feculent nor more you quite yet. I feel like I would need to play around with it a lot. Um, but, um, it seems like it's got some options because all it has to be is more than one inch is one inch away from another terrain piece or another model. Right. Right. Yep. So you could literally take that thing and drop it on top of an objective. Yep. Sure. If the objective's out in the middle of nowhere. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you could, uh, it's fairly sizable, so you could use it to block a lane. Um, if you have a terrain heavy board, um, you can do a, a lot of different things with it. And the, the fact that, you know, uh, Horticulous Slimux lets you get another one. And with the contagion points that we'll talk about in a second, you can summon more of them for free. Um, and they just drop near your heroes. Like they're an interesting thing to like try and use strategically to block off objectives and paths for your opponent, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that whole like mortal wound potential is really just sort of like an eh, secondary ability. Like, yeah, you might get a mortal wound once in a while. 
Um, but it does, like if you plant it right next to an objective, it potentially is punishing your opponent for sitting on an objective, which uh, is always good for you. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, it's, I think that is one of its sort of chief abilities because it, it, you know, it's not like it does the most mortal wounds. It, you know, on a four up, it triggers basically D3 mortal wounds to the people around it if they're, if you're not Nurgle. And okay, like that's still a pretty hefty tax to pay for a lot of units sitting on a point. Uh, it certainly makes your like weak hero that you've just got like holding some random point that's not going to work out well, right? Like, cause oftentimes people will hold like a non-essential point with just, you know, some weaker hero that's maybe down a wound or two and you're trying to preserve them. So you just kind of go, go, you go take that thing. That's not really in a contested area anymore. Um, a tree sitting there says that, that, that individual is not going to live long on that point. Very likely. Right. So. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, also worth pointing out. Um, Nurgle has some fairly strong flying units. So, um, yeah, between the, uh, the Pustule Blight Lords or whatever their name is and the, uh, mm -hmm. the Plague Drones, like those are both pretty effective offensive units that both fly. So they ignore that thing being, a you know, a terrain piece in the way. Uh, so that's, I think, really useful um, that you could potentially be blocking up things for your opponent, but not yourself. Yep. Um, the, and, and so then, you know, you start out with one Gnarl Maw, but then obviously that brings us right to Contagion Points. So this is the sort of third Allegiance ability, right? Yep. And so the Contagion Points are this thing you're sort of totaling. Um, what's notable about them is they, they trigger at the start of each of your hero phases. Right. Yep. Um, so because a lot of this has to do with moving and your play your area on the board. So obviously yeah. you would have had to got you would have had to have gotten there last turn or something, or or you know, yeah. moved in some kind of area unorthodox way. Um, so basically you get three if there are any friendly Nurgle models in your starting territory, three if there are any friendly Nurgle models in your opponent's starting territory. If there are no enemy models in the same territory as friendly Nurgle models, it's plus one, and you get D3 for every feculent Gnarl Maw that has no enemy models within three inches of it. So, um, you know, assumingly, at the start of the first turn, right? Like, turn one, <laughs> it's your turn, okay? Yeah, turn one, you're getting four plus D3. Right, exactly. Assuming they have not gotten either near your tree or into your starting zone, which isn't always the case. Like if you go second, you know, there are armies that could yeah. suddenly be in your starting area. Um, but <laughs> namely yeah. most of the good ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but it's an interesting thing to note here that like you going second, if your opponent, if you haven't zoned people out properly, like somebody dipping a toe into your starting area robs you of a point. Right. Like it's not the biggest deal, but they rob you of a point. And that is kind of relevant for that first turn, because if you've got four plus a D three, you could actually get to seven without doing anything in the first turn. Uh, multiples of seven being the magic number here. Right. Yep. Uh, but if you have only three plus a D three, well, that doesn't equal seven under any circumstance. Right. So it's not like you should hang your hat on this. My read on these like contagion points is use them for trees. Like yeah. that's it. Um, or occasionally maybe you hold like, I, I guess maybe you hold a little bit of uh reinforcement points back or whatever, or whatever for maybe occasionally you get like, you know, a little thing that's a random roadblock somewhere. Right. Yeah. Um, because the, the feculent normal is like seven contagion points being yes. um i think the other interesting possibility here is um there are a number of war scrolls that uh give you bonuses if you have a friendly nurgle hero within seven inches of the unit so this also gives you the ability to hold a summoning pool aside and when you need a hero to be near a particular unit to give it buffs, you can just kind of pop a hero. Yep. 
out near it. Uh, now it needs to be within 12 inches of a feculent gnarl maw or a friendly Nurgle hero. Um, and the standard nine from enemies. Yep. Yeah. And the standard nine from enemies. Um, so there's also something really interesting on this table that I don't know if you caught. Um, that for seven, you can also get one Nurgling. Yep, or one Nurgling base. One Nurgling base or five Plague Bearers. Yep. Those are less than full unit size. Yes, they are. And we have no reference to that being like cheaper for some reason. Uh, nope, um, I, I would assume not. So, I mean, I think that almost feels like either like you're paying a penalty for a hasty summoning uh, and you just have to pay the full points for a max unit even though you're getting less than a max unit uh, or we're as I had you know, mentioned previously potentially getting a change to single model pricing instead of unit pricing sure it's an interesting it is an interesting note yeah the like one nurgling base as it stands right now, it, obviously the problem with the, the Feculent Gnarl Maws in later rounds is they have to heed the same rules, right, for when you summon them. Like, that is to say, they, they have to still be, like, within 12 inches of a hero or a Gnarl Maw, 9 inches from enemy model, and 1 inch from terrain. So, like, later in the game, you could very well run out of space where you can legally put one of those trees, right? Yes. Um, like, especially um, mid-game. When there's still sort of the max number of things on the table, so it can get rough in like, you know, bottom two, three type of zone time. Yeah. The other interesting thing about this is that the uh, summoning occurs at the end of your movement phase, not um, during your hero phase. Yeah. Yeah. That is a very good point that should be mentioned because you need to put it near one of the heroes or another tree. Um, you can, you know, run a hero out there and then summon them there, right? So yes, yeah. Um, but, but very interesting, and you can definitely accumulate these points like really quickly. Um, so those fourteens and twenty ones, I think, are not outrageous. That's like, you know, turn two, turn three, potentially getting, uh, getting those things in there. Yeah, I'll be interested to see if anybody really like um, puts together a list heavily focused on contagion points because there's a, there's a couple ways to manipulate your contagion points in the in the tome. You know, like it's not it's not all over the place, but it's there. Um, and obviously, you could run like you could do a tree spam, you know, with yeah. like with with Mister Snail Rider, and you could just yeah. kind of have him like farm on your backboard edge. Right, yeah. because like you could just start putting trees on your back board edge, like one inch away from each other, you know, and and theoretically they don't have enemies near them. They're not doing anything else, right? Like at that point, they're not catapulting your units and allowing you to run and charge or causing mortal wounds, which is the two things they're they're otherwise doing. Um, you're just literally like planting a gross orchard at the back of the board to like start feeding you contagion points. I don't, I can't picture a world where that's worth it, but. I haven't thought it through enough to, to not know that it isn't right. So, yeah. Uh, um, the other thing that I was just thinking of, and I'm trying to look up the scroll real quick because unfortunately I have this in a PDF, not in a book form at the moment, but the hidden infestation rules on nerdlings. Um, okay. So it would not quite work the way I thought it would. Um, but, uh, you know, it, Nurglings now can deep strike. So right. uh, is a quick and easy way to get um, your, get, you know, a friendly Nurgle unit onto your opponent's side of the board somewhere to get extra contagion points. Um, so that's a, a pretty quick way to increase that quickly as well. Sure. The, um, it'd be very interesting to see the, the, the Nurgle versus Sylvaneth matchup is going to be fascinating as both people are trying to zone each other out with their woods, 
like people placing yeah. wood so the trees can't go down and gnarl moss so that so that woods can't go down. I want to put trees there. No, I yeah. want to put trees there. Who no, I want to put trees, trees there. faster. That's well, probably a Sylvaneth, but anyway, um, depending. But yeah. okay, I don't know. Um, We're getting a whole lot of wood. That's all I'm saying. That's right. Uh, so yes. By the way, I, somebody said they're surprised Tom hasn't shown up to to talk in the comments. He's really sick for those who missed that earlier. Like, I think he's unconscious right now um, because he was he was like heaving all day. And then I think he took a bunch of medicine and passed out. So, uh, you know, he did take a pause in between uh, bathroom trips to uh, argue with me about Rodigus, though. I'm so. sure that's true. Yeah, <laughs> it's hard to keep him off of like all social media. But I think at this point he's finally passed out. So there you go. Yep. Um, OK. So let's move on. Let's talk about some command traits. Now, obviously, these are split up between uh, your Rotbringer, your Demon, and your Mortal. Um, so yep. we've still got all that kind of stuff going on. Um, and obviously, there are lots of heroes who, uh, let's say, dip a toe in multiple of these waters, right? So uh, there are, like, Rotbringer Mortals and Mortal Demons and stuff like that, right? So yep. um, we can we can... That th you might have your choice. Uh, obviously, all of them have the grandfather's blessing, which you mentioned earlier, which is the once for battle at the start of the phase. Um, you can cycle it up or down one, basically, right? If your general has not been slain. Um, so anybody can pick that one. Uh, I find that actually to be the least interesting one here. I'm not sure I would ever take that. Uh, yeah. It's interesting because it's once per game, but then looking across all of the other command traits, there's not really much that like jumps out at me. That's like, oh, I really need to take that. Um, but I assume you have some other picks. I do. I do have some picks here. There is a couple that I actually really, really love. Um, the uh, one of them that I really love for the um uh for the nurgle mortal is hideous visage which is yep. subtract two from the bravery characteristic of enemy units while they are within three inches of your general um just straight up two bravery penalty there's actually a fair amount of bravery penalty tenonizing in this army um so like bravery bombing can very much be a thing with this force and, uh, you know, in a world of big hordes and stuff or, or anything like that, or, or even not, um, you know, like I think about like playing my iron jaws and how much I would fear that, that thing being around because like my iron jaws with their brave, my brutes with their eye or their bravery of six, generally, if I like lose one or maybe two, which is often what happens, I'm not super worried about bravery rolls, you know, like on dice, I'm still usually pretty good. Uh, yeah. but when their bravery goes down by two suddenly that brute unit is very likely to evaporate on that roll, right? And because, and I'm never making these guys immune to Battleshock. Like, that's not happening. Get out of here. We, we got a wah, baby. Um, so, like, it's, it's, that one jumped out at me as being uh, pretty darn good. Um, I liked that quite a bit. The overpowering stench also on the Nurgle Mortals, the reroll hit rolls of six plus for attacks that target your general in the combat phase was very interesting if you have a very sort of melee focused dude who's going to be in the mix um shuts it's a good counter there's a there's a similar sort of thing on the wheel but it's a good counter to a lot of explosive type of uh attacks right where on six plus blah 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 happens so yeah uh yeah. i liked that one there's a couple different ones the other one that everybody has by the way that we should mention is the living plague one which is at the start of your hero phase Basically, each enemy unit within an inch of your general on a four up, um, they get a mortal wound and you get a contagion point. So that's another that's like one of your contagion point things, fillers. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think the unfortunate thing about contagion points is that it's still summoning. So you still need a pool of points set aside, at least with, you know, there's some speculation that we might have changes to summoning coming um although we have nothing really official other than speculation from all like like every book that has come out has basically changed how summoning works in some way except like zinch i think 
Um, so I, the contagion points are basically for most purposes, just going to be like, uh, summon more trees, summon more trees, summon more right. trees and yep. summoning more trees is good for summoning more trees. So, <laughs> <laughs> so now so can I tell you my absolute favorite one? You want to know yeah. my absolute favorite command trait? Like one that I, I, oh my God, I love it so much. Like, I would make this would probably be one of the things I would take every time if I were to ever run this gross army, but I love this one. Okay, you ready? Yeah. All right. My favorite, favorite one is Tainted Corruptor, which is one of the demon ones. Yep. Okay. Um, so at the start of each of your hero phases, you pick a terrain feature that is within three inches of your general. Just do that. Okay. For the rest of the battle. That terrain feature has the Sickness Blossoms scenery rule from the Feculent Gnar Gnarl Maul War Scroll in addition to any other rules it already had. So the Sickness Blossoms uh, scenery rule is the whole, like, roll and on a four up, you take D3 mortal wounds, or if you're Nurgle, you heal D3 wounds. What? <laughs> That's amazing! <laughs> Think about the size of some of the terrain pieces that are on AOS tables. The fact, like, your general can easily often start out within three inches of a terrain piece, right? Like, yeah. That's not hard. So, turn one, you're just like, that, and then as you're running around the board, like this horrible Disney princess, this, like, flowers <laughs> are growing behind you that are just, like, poison gas. And it's just like, and that is sick, and that is sick, and that is sick, and that is sick, and there's more trees, and that is sick. Like the entire board is now just four up explosions of mortal <laughs> wounds. Um, that's yep. the funniest thing to me. Like, again, I don't actually know if that's hyper competitive, but it doesn't seem super bad. I'll say that much. Making <laughs> making terrain literally poisonous for your enemy to stand on and healing for you. Yes. Seems pretty good. Like that just seems pretty good. I don't know. Yeah, actually, that does seem very, very good. And, um, you know, it, now that I, I'm thinking about this a little bit, I, I'm still processing this army, right? I understand. It's, this yeah. is all very fresh. As per usual with this, folks, this is, we've had like, what, four days with the book or something? I mean, yeah, guess yeah. what? You know, there, there are going to be things that we don't think of and stuff we missed. Yeah, that, sorry. Yeah, um, so... If you use Tainted Corruptor, plus just planting trees all over the place, I mean, you can basically just, it, like, there's nothing in that uh, Contagion Blossoms rule, I don't think, that says, like, next to a Blight tree. Um, so, like, you could potentially have one, mo or one unit that's next to multiple Tainted Terrain features so it has to roll multiple times to get D3 mortal wounds. So you're potentially just kind of turning the entire board into this minefield of uh, just tainted stuff for your opponent to be trying to run through. Uh, it does have the any in it. So it says um, at the start of your hero phase, roll a die for each unit within three inches of any feculent normal maw. So it does. There you go. Yeah. But so it, sadly. It, yeah, go ahead. It does say specifically feculent gnarl maw yeah not other terrain features it gains the sickness blossom ability but uh, assumingly that means that that terrain feature now counts with that ability because it says it triggers it so yeah yeah but in any case it's still like okay wherever you are you're, yeah. you're d3 mortal wounds on a four up absolutely um, um like there just isn't safe place space on the board um yeah. that could be a really interesting uh way to build an army absolutely and and i think it's been mentioned in the comments but like i i am pretty sure you could do it on sylvaneth wildwoods too like somebody could summon a wildwood and you could be like poison woods <laughs> so <laughs> that seems pretty awesome to be completely frank <laughs> fuck your dry ass <laughs> yeah like take that uh you know it's not gonna kill anything like outright but man does that make it sucky for them to just stand in those woods so i do like that yeah. Yeah, it, it finally we all can kind of stick it to Sylvaneth a little bit because that army is super annoying to play against. Uh, yeah, 
So very and, fun. And wouldn't, and wouldn't if, if like if they if Sylvanath takes um a wildwood and uses like three bases, that all counts as one terrain feature, correct? As far as I know, yeah, it's one terrain feature consisting of multiple. So then you have this huge swath of the board with Tainted Corruptor yep. that is now like anything in that terrain feature is either going to heal if it's yours or take D3 mortal wounds on a four up if it's your opponents. Yep. And, that, and as has been pointed out, I, I didn't put a fine enough point on it, but I really do want to mention it. That trigger is at the start of the hero phase. So Not it's every time. Yeah, exactly. Every, everybody, everybody, everybody. Yeah. Everybody, everybody. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty good. Um, yeah. The, I like that a lot. So um, I'm just saying the, the, they will turn the whole, like they easily have the ability to turn the whole board toxic. Um, if you don't bring like a little, uh, you should just have like Britney Spears toxic queued up on your phone and ready to go if you're running this army because i think that's a, an essential soundtrack uh all right yeah i mean and then it, it, if you take a great unclean one with the bell and you're on the uh first uh stage of the corruption table you've got you know your great unclean ones your general means he's moving 10 plus a run <laughs> Yep. So he's just great unclean one dancing around with a bell, making things poisonous. Yeah, that's going to be hilarious. All right. So obviously, I think there's some fun stuff in the uh, in in here for sure. I mean, obviously, there's some other stuff that's kind of like less that's I don't know boring to some degree, but is still yeah. good. Um, like there's We've a plus a one. Yeah, there's like a plus one rend for attacks made by your general in the combat phase, which is cool. Like plus rend is usually good. Um, there's like a, uh, the rot bringers have like a six up wound negation thing, which there's a lot of ability to stack that because you know, it's there are, there are people who have like, you can take that and there's an item that does it. And you know, there's a, uh, the harbinger has a command ability. that does it. So you could, you can get to that Tom thing that he loves where you're like, Oh, I took a wound. Armor save. Nope, failed that. Five up. Nope, six up. Nope, six up. Okay, just like keep rolling. I'm going to keep rolling until I say no, that that wound didn't happen. If you, you know, you can build for that, I guess, too. But it's much yeah. less exciting. All right. So obviously artifacts are split up much the same way. Again, we've got the Rot Bringer, uh, Daemonic, and Mortal Hero uh, stuff. Uh you know, these are big lists, six artifacts per thing. Again, is there anything that uh, that grabbed your that grabbed your fancy? Um, I think the Rust Fang is really awesome. Uh, you know, enemy unit within uh, three inches of the hero is minus one to save for the rest of the battle. Um, and uh, in each of your hero phases, uh roll a d6 on a five up at any enemy units within uh six inches take d3 mortal wounds like that's pretty good that that's a really nice uh i feel like the lord of afflictions just really wants to have that and run around and be a jerk to things you were talking about two separate items there just to be clear the rust fang and the flesh peeler is that what you mean because the rust fang is the neg one save thing, and the flesh peeler is the roll in your hero oh. phase roll, and you get the five plus. I'm totally looking at the wrong thing here, but yes, the in any case, the rust fang is the minus one to save for the rest of the battle is like brutal. Yeah, there's a couple like the rust fang has been the one on everyone's radar, and and understandably so. Now the key is you can never use it more than once on a single unit, but still, it just happens. Right. Yeah. So like, that's pretty good. Um, I, it's, <laughs> this is the wrong use for it. Okay. <laughs> um, but it's funny to me to like, to hit a unit that's like six up that feels like, Hey, we're, we're lucky we get this t-shirt save and you remove it completely basically. And you're like, ha ha, you get, <laughs> you're back to having no save. Like, it'd be a fun thing to do to, like, Marauders or whatever. Some unit there, whatever, not Marauders, whatever. Re somebody recently got a six-up save, the um, Blood Reavers or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, they got a six-up. They didn't have one before. Like, oh, we're back to like we were. Uh, that's the wrong use of that. 
the right use for that is obviously like you find their their anvil unit their three up two up whatever nonsense and just you know start cracking the shell um we're gonna t- come back to that later um yeah, yeah that's a great one no doubt uh yeah I like that we have an artifact that can either turn a regular hero into a wizard uh, or give uh, a wizard an extra spell to cast. Yep. Um, We've got one that gives a wizard just plus one to their casting rolls, which I think is overall one of the most powerful artifacts in all of this, just for sheer gaminess. Um, There's a lot of stuff in the... uh, a lot of the spells in Nurgle go off on seven, which is like only like sixty percent odds or so to go off. Uh, so, but if you get plus one to that, it goes up to like eighty. So it's uh, is it eighty or is it seventy something? In either case, it's going up a lot. Um, it, it's going from you know a little bit better than fifty fifty to most of the time. Yep. Um, so I think that's really good. Uh, endless gift is just ridiculous. Uh, um, endless gift is a pretty great one. So, do you want to explain how it's uh, that's for the for demons? Uh, yeah. For anybody with a demon, do you want to explain how that one works? Yeah, you basically take you know each wound that uh, like in the battle shock phase, you take you roll a d6 for each wound that the model has suffered uh, in that turn, and on a four up, it heals a wound. Yep. So you're just healing back half of the wounds you took every game, every turn. Well, uh, more than, um, because it says each wound that was allocated to this model. So you could have prevented it through other means, and you'd still get to roll the dice. Interesting. Uh, I because did not read it right. yeah, it's at the start of the battle shock phase. Roll dice for each wound that was allocated to this model. So like when you at the allocating the wounds to a model happens before those damage prevention steps, right? Like those damage prevention yeah. type rolls, because they say, if you think of it like, well, I'll just, I'll read the direct text off the one that's before this. Um, roll a dice each time you allocate a wound or mortal wound to the bearer on a six plus the wound is negated. So the allocation step comes before the negation step by necessity, right? Like right. that's that's just the way it has to work. So, um, so the key being like, if you have, if you're building that stupid Tom army that like stacks five up, six up, six up, six up, six up, or, you know, whatever nonsense he manages to achieve. Right. Um, and that model gets allocated 12 wounds. Okay. And then you, you know, you knock out, uh, you know, five of them, you still get to roll 12 dice. Right. (laughs) <laughs> and, and you're going to heal like six of those well, statistically or whatever. Um, you're going to heal like six of those. <laughs> so that's pretty good. Um, one, one quick thing that I I'll honestly ask, cause I see it being discussed in the comments. People are talking about the exalted Guo and giving him this. Okay. Like the exalted greater unclean one, the forge world guy. Um, the exalted Guo's, all the exalted demons have the language of being unique. I'm not sure if it's ever been answered of whether or not you can give them stuff because they're like a unique character. I don't know if somebody, if that has been clarified, somebody please point me to it. I'm I'm, this is not me saying it. This is me raising the question because I'm honestly curious. Uh, I'm not sure that you can actually give those guys like, you know, th- they might count as like special characters because they have the same language of like only one of this model being be included in your army. Like they have that unique wording. So, yeah. Um, but another, anyways, another very good uh, Tom artifact is the uh, the Wither Stave. Uh, so enemies within twelve inches of the bearer have to re-roll hit rolls of six. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, very important to key in here that it is hits of six not hits of six or greater so that's a natural six on the dice not it not a modified six so you can have your opponent be getting debuffs from other effects and now they also have to re-roll those sixes which are uh like 
they're hit all the time. Yep. Right. With the new uh, rule of one. So it, the fact that it's like an unmodified six with all of the possible hit debuffs that are floating around is really powerful. Yeah. Yep. Um, it's just a big bu bubble of no. Yeah. A hundred percent. I, I, yep, 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 yep. Uh, I like that one a lot. I think that's really good, especially with, you know, as you mentioned, like there, there is a fair amount of ability to apply around some negatives in this army. As we all know, that's classically like the Nurgle ability. Um, right. so, you know, that's, that's a scary combination. I think we would be remiss if we didn't mention Nurgle's nail. Okay. Which is the, uh, the demon item. So, uh, basically you pick one of the melee weapons to be Nurgle's nail at the end of each combat phase, roll 2d6 for each enemy model that was allocated any wounds caused by Nurgle's nail in that phase and was not slain. If the result is exactly seven, the model being rolled for is slain. Any other result has no effect. So you got a 16% chance, because that's what you've got to roll a seven on 2d6. You have a 16% chance that anybody you allocated to just drops dead. Just <laughs> here. Like, get out of here. <laughs> You're dead. Yeah. Archeon? Yeah, no, sorry. Yeah, Those... I think that's hilarious. Yeah. There's, I love that there are, is so much stuff in this book that is like, there's stuff that is very good for a solid competitive force. There's stuff that's nice for a like well-rounded, all comers, balanced, fair sort of game. And then there's stuff in here like that, that is just fun. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is actually one of two different things that does this effect by the by. Um, yes. which is funny. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Um, you know, there's a, there's a couple other, like, I don't want to dig into all these. There's, there's some fun ones, uh, around the eye of Nurgle was the other one they already spoiled, right? Which is the once per battle, you can kind of open it and pick a, you know, if there's a model within 12 inches and it, then roll two dice. And if it's a seven, the closest enemy model is slain. So that one's, you only get to use that one once, but it's, you know, um, it's the kind of situation where uh, you uh, you don't have to be engaged in combat or have done anything else other than be near them. The problem with it is it's at the start of your hero phase. So, like, unless you're on the, the second part of a double turn, right, it's not like your enemy has some ability to control that, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, the hilarious. <laughs> exactly. A uh, lot of good stuff in here. I, what impressed me is that there's a couple like real whiffs in here. Um, like I, I, pfft, there's some of them that I'm like, nope, never, not even like the virulent, the yeah. virulent blade. That was exactly what? the one I was just looking at. Like, <laughs> that has to be the worst one in this book. It is what, like I, what? It is. And it's just a weapon made of sadness. Yeah, it's good God. Basically, so so that we bring everybody else along, the virulent blade is like you pick one weapon and you get to add one to the damage characteristic made for attacks with the virulent blade if the wound roll for the attack is five plus. Now, there are ways to get bonuses to wound in this army, but who cares? <laughs> like there are most armies just have an artifact that's just plus one to damage. Like that's the most yeah. boring thing that's sort of like the stock baseline. Putting that on uh uh putting that on the uh <laughs> putting that on on a, on a conditional is just what why why would you do that uh yeah okay uh yeah. i feel like in almost every one of these it's almost designed in like there's like it's designed like if you're playing a game where you're rolling a D six to determine your artifacts and command traits, it seems like every table has like a whammy. Yeah. Yeah. This is the whammy. <laughs> <laughs> this is the whammy. No doubt. All right. 
Uh, so let's talk about magic because they've obviously got some spells as we keep digging through this. Yes. Uh, so we got three spells as options for wizard as per standard. Each wizard in Nurgle army knows one spells from the lures, depending on what they are, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, you also have the, all of them also know the foul um, regenesis spell automatically. So that, that isn't taking up your choice, right? Um, yeah. And that's the one that's like on a seven, you get to pick a result from the stage of corruption table and basically reset it to that stage. Um, okay. okay. So high level, and I know we talked a little bit about this before the show. I am blown away by this magic. Um, this like, is really good. They have some very solid spells in here. Scary, scary, scary spells. Yeah. Uh, now, again, I don't want to go through every one of these, but there is a lot that I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty good. Uh, what, 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 what are some of your, what are some of your picks? What are some of your hot picks? Um, the, uh, the favored poxes is fantastic. It's for demons, uh, goes off on a seven An enemy unit in 14 inches is minus one to hit wound and save until the caster moves, casts another spell or dies. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and I would just like to point out that your great unclean one can just stab himself and give himself plus one to cast. And he can also take an artifact, to give him plus one to cast. So that's pretty good. <laughs> yep. Um, uh, Blades of putrefaction. Also pretty ridiculous. That's for Rotbringer wizards. Uh, goes off on a seven uh, friendly unit in 14 inches does mortal wounds on hits of six plus in the combat phase in addition to normal wounds are in addition to their normal damage. So it's uh, it works like the concussors ability, not like the blood letters ability. Right. Um, but I mean, with the combination of various other things that you have, I mean, you can pump up the movement on your guys pretty significantly in this army. Um, if you, you know, combine all the things together. So if you get this spell off on say like a unit of 30 plague bearers and charge them into your opponent, I mean, it's basically like a blood letter bomb with a ward save. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Like uh, blades <laughs> of future factions, another one that's got a lot of attention and rightly so. Um, I would like to point out Glorious Afflictions, okay? Yep. Um, because it has a super long range and a low cast by the standards of this book. So it's 21-inch cast and on a 5, right? Yep. Uh, and basically, you pick a unit visible to the caster, and their move characteristic and any run or charge rolls made for them are halved, rounding up until your next hero phase. Uh, in addition... Units that can fly cannot do so until your next hero phase. And it's that last part that is so good to me. Uh, yes. That's solid. That's super solid. Yeah. Um, that, is, that is a heck of a movement debuff. And I mean, you know, with the, I don't want to get into like what a lot of these things become if you bail win the caster. There's plenty of bail windable casters. And, you know, yep. that spell going to 42 inches and like, being able to shut down anything, even in, you know, off the triangle corners to basically not being able to move much at all or fly. Like if somebody, a lot of people right now set up their units in ways to screen them and then fly hop over them. Right. Yeah. And the, like just shutting that off and being like, Nope, you blocked yourself in. Now your chaff wall is also blocking you. Right. Like, yeah. that's potent as all get out. Um, mm -hmm. So it, that, that spell, like I, I love sort of board control things like that because they always surprise people, right? People have a way that they like set up or think about their movement. They don't, it's easy for them to think about what's on your board and react accordingly. Like, okay, they've got that unit there. I need to move this unit here to respond to that. People don't tend to think about intangibles. Like what if he casts that spell and locks my unit behind my other one? Right. Yeah. 
Yep. Uh, and the Gift of Contagion, also fantastic. Uh, it's for Rotbringer Wizards, six up to cast. Uh, an enemy unit in 18 inches gets selected. You roll a D6. On a one or a two, it's minus one to hit. On a three or a four, it's minus one to wound. On a five or a six, it's minus one to save. Yep. I will take any of those three options any day. Absolutely. All good. And another, it's another swing at the neg one to save, which we're going to see a couple different, like, this is not the last time we're going to see the ability to minus out people's saves. We saw it with the rust blade. Here it is again. And we're going to see it more as we get into this. Right. So like yeah. <clears throat> to me, uh, yeah, I, I like all of those. Like, okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> like you said, like I'll roll this dice and it's there. There are only good results. You know, what yeah. I mean? so there's no like, oh, you rolled a one and it does D3 mortal wounds to your caster. Nope. Nope. None of that. It's right. just which, like, how bad is it going to be for your opponent is the question. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. So there's, there's a lot of good stuff here. One, uh, like we, we're going to accidentally go through all of them, but I do want to give a quick shout out for Magnificent Boobos, the Nurgle Mortal <laughs> Wizard one, uh, which is a gross spell, but Casting value of seven, but a long range of 21 inches. Targets an enemy hero. Uh, D3 mortal wounds. And in addition, that hero subtracts one from their hit rolls, casting rolls, and unbinding rolls until your next hero phase. Uh, it is the casting and unbinding that I really love about that one. Uh, the sort of anti-magic tech of the ability to like start, you're starting to punish the wizards behind the lines. But even if you don't kill them, you know, a neg one swing on cast and unbinds is a big deal. As you pointed out in your 2d6 thing, like even plus one, you know, that the math changes a lot there. If your guo's on plus one and they're on minus one, you have put a wide gulf in their ability to dispel your spells. Like that's the reality there. Yeah. And, you know, if they have a caster that wants to put up a, a bail win, bail win going off on eight instead of seven is like, like it's practically impossible in in, yeah. in like in like game consistency terms. Like you're you're really going for the long ball. Like th that's not an easy thing to achieve. The real the yeah exactly. I mean, moving that to an eight means this. If they tried, if they attempted to summon a bail win five rounds in a row, they would only get it two out of those five yes. rounds. Now, obviously, they're not. That wouldn't happen because why did they if once they've summoned it it's there but the point being is that that's that's the real math of your five turn game right yeah um and it's only a three inch difference but you can cast that spell at 21 inches and most enemy wizards can only unbind at 18 right so you can target a wizard with that spell that is out of its unbinding range <laughs> yep yep absolutely all right, so let's talk about uh, let's. So I think they've covered the spells. Shall we? Shall we talk about some battalions, some battalions, as, yes. as they say? Yes. All right. Um, so there's a. Oh, go ahead. You you start. There's not even that many. Um, there's really not compared there's, to like yeah. Stormcast. Yeah. Sure. Um, and the one I think, I, you know, we might as well talk about it first because Tom's not here and we have to give our tip <laughs> of the hat to Tom. Um, the one that's not in the book that is going to get taken like all the time, the, uh, uh, oh, why am I blanking on the name of it? The Plague something? Yeah, let's just call it the Plague Band, but it's the Ever Chosen Battalion. Yes. That's yeah, the Ever Chosen Battalion. So it's a hero and seven other... Uh, Mortal Nurgle units. Mortal, mortal units. Um, everything is minus one to hit against them if they're if your units are in uh, start in sizes in multiples of seven, they get um, their uh, unit leader can puke on your opponent and like, just like do D three mortal wounds, um, and they. Uh, God, what else do they get? Um, there's some other ability in there. Um, the, the big thing is that it, it's like a really easy way to just get a one drop army. Right. And, and everything is minus one to hit you in combat. Yep. Yep. And the, you know, the relevant 
obviously the ever chosen one, I think one of the big advantages to it. And the thing I'll say overall about the battalions in this book is the battalions in this book are pretty properly costed. And by that, I mean, they're expensive. Yes. Um, I think battalions are supposed to be expensive. You get a lot out of battalions between the extra magic item controlling your drops and the special abilities. Like battalions are doing heavy lifting. And so like, I feel like I'm, I'm one of those, I, maybe I'm in a minority, maybe not. I don't know. But I generally feel like the adjustment on battalion points that happened at GHB 17 was correct. And most of these feel like they're pointed pretty, pretty correctly. That, that is to say, they're all like high hundreds, 200, 220, that kind of area, right? Yeah. It, it's basically it, the, the cost of a fairly elite unit. Right. Yep. Yep. Because it's certainly going to do that amount of work, right? Yes. Um, just in what it adds. Uh, so looking at the battalions actually here, what yep. were there any that jumped out at you that you particularly liked? You know, oh, oh, real quick, I'll give a general breakdown of like, there's sort of the cyst battalions that are based around the, the, the mortals. Yeah, like the individual stuff. So like the Lord of Blights and the Putrid Blight Kings, which is the Blight Cyst. There's the Lord of Plagues, the Plague Cyst, and the Putrid Blight Kings. And then there's the Affliction Cyst, which is the Lord of Afflictions, and the Puscoil Blight Lords, the Flying Blight Kings, right? So they, they get like three of their own. And then there's like a, a, a Mega Battalion for, um, for, for those guys, which I don't think anybody would ever take. There's Hort yeah. Hortica, 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 Snail Guy. <laughs> Snail Guy has his own one. Uh, and then there's obviously the thrice fold befoulement, which is what, uh, Ben Johnson put together for, you know, his, uh, his group of the three guos, you know, or two goes and Rodigus. And then there's the big tally band. So it's kind of the overview, but what jumped yeah. out at you? Um, I really like the tally band, um, it, for like competitive play purposes, because this easily is like the majority of your force in one drop. Yeah. Um, which is really valuable for competitive play. Um, it lets you include a great unclean one, and it's a keyworded great unclean one. So if you want to use Rodigus, you can use Rodigus. Right. Um, you can use uh, one to three heroes, and one of those is a Poxbringer who is a wizard. So uh, you know, given the strength of the magic that you have available to you, being able to include three extra wizards in the battalion is really good. Um, and then four to seven units in any combination of plague bearers and plague drones. Uh, that's basically your battle line of plague bearers plus one more unit. So uh, that's like barely taxing you anything. Um, it's basically fill out your battle line plus one more unit. Um, and then zero to three units of Beasts of Nurgle and Nurglings, which I think that is usually going to be a zero, but um, unless you have like a random extra 100 points you want to throw into that. Um, but the big thing that it does is that it heals one wound uh, in each of your hero phases to every unit in the battalion. Yep. And... Plague bearers return D3 slain models to the unit. Yep. Uh, and if you happen to have the maxed out uh, full seven of the plague bearers and plague drones, uh, you get one extra contagion point in each hero phase. Yeah, that's a, it's, oh boy. Like that's a tough ask. <laughs> Seven yeah. units of plague bearers and plague drones. Okay. You know, uh, I, I don't know how big of an ask it really is. Um, I've been toying around with lists and I'm like, you know, with the command ability on the great unclean one and the ability now on your plague drones that they get plus one to each of their attacks when they're within seven inches of a hero. Um, those plague drones can hit really freaking hard. Um, those are suddenly really good. So um, I think being able to fill this out with like, you know, mostly plague bearers and like two or three units of plague drones um, is, you know, that when you're thinking of like making a one drop list out of this, 
That doesn't seem unreasonable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously it's, it's your demon focused army. And I think maybe that's, you know, the thing of it, like you're, you're not getting any of the Rob Ringer stuff, the mortal stuff as it were in here. This is obviously your one for, for, you know, pure, pure demons as it were. And yeah. to me, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm highly questionable on that. Like the plague drones can gen a lot of attacks. I'm not sure whether they can go the distance though, because on, on, their actual damage and rend is pretty lacking. But that being said, as we've discussed, there are lots of ways to crack armor off people in this army. So maybe that's not as relevant. I, you know, I don't know. You know, I'm not sure. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, the one that jumped out at me and, and, you know, it's probably the least surprising one. I'm sure it jumped out to most people was the blight cyst. Um, which is the one that's the Lord of Blights, uh, plus the, the new guy, right? Plus three to six units of Blight Kings, and then optionally a Sorcerer and optionally a Harbinger. Um, and, you know, in this, you've got basically the Munificent Bounty ability of the Lord of Blights, his, like, handout heads thing. <laughs> he could give them to everybody. Um, it makes all the Blight King's weapons in this battalion have a rend characteristic of Neg 1, which is, seems insane to me with all of the armor-cracking stuff we've already talked about. Yeah. And um, and then the, the really interesting one is Blights on the Landscape, which is in the combat phase, enemy units don't receive any benefits for being in cover against attacks made by this battalion. Yet another effective armor save debuff. Right. Yes. Because how often do people take these sort of non uh, monster heroes and set them on, a th uh, you know, like a cover and go, oh, my three up is now two up for free. Ha ha ha. You know, right. And suddenly you're like, nope, your three up is still a three up. By the way, Rust Blade. Now it's a four up. By the way, another thing that we haven't talked about yet or that uh, or that spell five up. You're dead. You're dead. <laughs> yep. Uh like that is that is a big swing real fast uh so that was that was the one that kind of jumped out to me um they're all interesting i none of them though felt like yep that's the one you know what i'm saying like there's no there's no like originally when the first time i read hammer strike battalion <laughs> or something like yeah. that right um yeah uh yeah. now there's there's okay. nothing in here that's like, oh, yeah, everybody's going to be building their, you know, competitive tournament army around this battalion. Yeah, exactly. Um, I will say from a hilarious point of view, the Affliction Cyst, which is the, like, the Lord of Afflictions and then all the Puscoil Blight Lords, like your flying Blight King drones, yep. Blight drones, whatever, um, they... So he has his command ability. We'll, we'll just kind of jump to you. We'll use this to transition to talk about individual sort of war scrolls that we like, because we're not going to cover every war scroll. My God, we'll be here until next Wednesday. Um, but the Lord of Afflictions, his command ability is basically this. Uh, you can use this ability in your hero phase. If you do pick a friendly Blight Lord unit within 14 inches of this model, add eight inches to that unit's move characteristic until your next hero phase. So they go from moving eight to moving 16. They become, you know, uh, disc writers, right? That's a lot of movement. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So the affliction, uh, afflicted cyst or whatever the heck it's called, um, makes it so when he uses that, it affects all of the uh, Puscoil Blight Lords within 14 inches of him. Um, yep, it does. <laughs> yes, it does. Um, ironically, you also have like a uh, you can you also get like a, a lightning strike sort of ability, right? You don't have to set up on the board. Instead, at the end of your first movement phase, you can set them up, which like is counterproductive. It's one of the things I don't like about this. Those two abilities don't work together. No, they do not. <laughs> right. Okay, I guess like it's all movement shenanigans, but I'd probably just have them on the board and go first turn charge because you could very easily first turn charge with that. Like 
now we're not even stretching because like now it is just like, well, the thing on the wheel and I'm 18 inches across the board. Yeah. And if the th just to, you know, add to it a little bit, use a great unclean one with a bell. Yeah. And so that's an extra plus three inches and it lets you, uh, you know, cast the spell to set the wheel to the plus two movement should it happen to not already be there anyway. Right. And the great unclean one can give himself plus one to cast. So it goes off on a six. So it's probably happening. So now you've got them like 16 plus two plus three, 21 inches. So three inch charge. Seems yep. Good. Seems good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and so let's just kind of talk about some individual war scrolls here that stand out to us and what we like. Let's let's pick a couple each. Um, yep. I mean, I mentioned the Lord of Afflictions. I love everything about this dude. Move eight, eight wounds, four up save, ten bravery. Um, I love him because he has every keyword. He's a mortal demon rot bringer, right? Yep. So dealer's choice on uh <laughs> on stuff for him. Um, he can make himself super fast. Uh or, or, or like he can uh or he can make his sorry his his boys super fast he can he has the uh the disgustingly resilient thing of the demons where he can negate you know he has the five up uh damage prevention um he heals automatically every turn he has a passive buff to all rot bringers within seven inches of him where they re-roll uh hit rolls of one very useful for your blight king style people who are you know fishing for sixes um yep. And, uh, he has the like virulent discharge thing that where like on a six up, he can deal mortal wounds or heal people around him. So, okay, cool. Yeah. Like, I think this dude's solid. He's got, you know, some decent rend, uh, decent number of attacks. He's not like the most brutal guy ever, certainly, but he's decent enough as far as numbers go. Um, yeah. and, and he's like 220 points or something. I mean, you know, I, Seems pretty worth it to me. He seems like a good pickup for 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 two twenty. So, yeah, yep. Um, What's your first pick? Um, uh, well, I, I will give you my first pick of being controversial, and I know we were talking about this before the show, and I was arguing with Tom about this earlier. Uh -huh. um, Everybody is like showing all kinds of love for Rodigus, and yep. I am not a buyer. I'm not a big fan of Rodigus. Um, so here's my thinking on this, right? His spell is the thing everybody's all excited about. Um, so his spell goes off on a seven. You roll seven dice, uh, consult the table. I'm starting on a four up. Um, for every four up rolled on those seven dice, it does D3 mortal wounds to... Uh, an enemy unit, and you have to pick an enemy unit for each, a uh, different enemy unit for each D3, so you can't stack them all onto one unit. Um, now, what I want to point out that is very negative about this, he is not the kind of character that is giving out any, like, passive buffs for being around him. So your primary purpose for him is to, one, cast this spell, and two, get into combat and mess stuff up. He doesn't even have a command ability. Um, so that spell's ability is on the damage table. So as soon as he takes four damage, that four up goes to a five up. Um, so I think that people are really overestimating the amount of damage that you're going to be able to do with his spell. Um, and he's also unique, so he can't take any artifacts. He can't take any command traits. Um, so you're just stuck with that seven unless you're on a piece of arcane terrain. Yeah. Um, I feel like that's a really... It's one of those things where like it and also you can't stack it onto one model so like yes you're sprinkling around a lot of mortal wounds but it's like a couple of wounds here and there um and i mean 
this guy, because of the power of his spell, he's going to be a target. So he's going to, he's not going to survive the whole game. <coughs> Excuse me. Which means he's going to take damage, which means he's going to be moving down his damage table. Um, I, I feel like he is very overrated. Um, and I would take the regular great unclean one over him every day of the week. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I disagree with you. The regular Guo, he's got a lot of interesting options as to how he's kitted out because of the, you know, the difference between the, uh, like, uh, flail, sword, uh, bile blade, doomsday bell, all of that kind of crap, right? And and how that works out, like the utility of that, uh, of the, as you mentioned, the bile blade where he can sort of cut himself and then add one to his casting rolls or, um, you know, the doomsday bell where it adds three to its move characteristic. Um, and that's any Nurgle thing, by the way, interestingly, I think one of the questions I had before this started was how much of this would affect Skaven. And the answer is not a lot, <laughs> right? But this would, yeah. if he rings the bell, the rats go a running, which seems appropriate. They're used to running at the sounds of bells. So yes. I feel like that, that works out. Um, you know, he's still a double caster. Like the regular Guo is still a double caster. Uh, yep. Right. Um, yeah. I mean. And his spell is really good. Yeah. I mean, sure. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not like blow your socks off good, but sure. it, it's, uh, it, it's nice that it, it basically has that option to, heal your guys, damage your opponent's guys, or possibly both. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, it's better than, you know, so one of the, in Magic, there's the discussion of, like, anytime they print a land of, like, is this land better than a basic land? Yeah. Right? Like, that argument. And so I feel like in this game that the the parallel is, is it better than Arcane Bolt? Right? Like, and so, like, I look at it and I'm like, well... It can clearly do more and more to wounds, but it's on a seven. So it's, you know, percentage wise, it's much harder to cast, but he can also buff his own cast if he's got the right kit out. And it's just like, I'm um, back and forth on it. It's not bad. I'll say that much. It's not worse than a base yeah. land, right? Um, the thing for me that kind of drives me crazy about the regular Guo is that his command ability only affects Nurgle demons. Now, you know, there's there are people in this army who are certainly absorbing the, you know, demon keyword because of other mitigating factors. Yep. Um, but I but part of me does wish that was just, you know, Nurgle unit and as well, because I think it would be more interesting. He he his stock would rise a lot if that just said Nurgle unit to me. Um, yep. But that being said, I, I've got to agree with you for the points differential. I I'm the regular guo is the way to go you know and like he's still a 16 wound four up save dude he can still deal a, a pretty you know good heap of damage um yeah and he still has his five up ward save in addition to the four up save and he reflects wounds back on sixes yep and he actually has a shooting attack which rodigus also loses by the way yes so yeah there you go I, I, i'm definitely a big fan um I, I, what I think is a little bit disappointing out of this book, and I know it, it's really in large part because of uh, all of the ally options that can carry the Nurgle keyword, there's just not a lot of actual unit options. If you go through this book, there is an outrageous number of monsters and heroes. Yep. Um Actually, let me see. I actually did a spreadsheet out of all of them to try and analyze <laughs> things. Um, uh, so there are 18 different uh, heroes and monsters. There are six units. Six. Plague bearers, plague drones, uh, pustule blight lords, blight kings, uh, nerglings, and uh, beasts of nurgle. I think what's maybe more impressive about that 18 uh, hero monster number is that nine of them are unique, are named yes. people. 
<laughs> a full half. Like Nurgle likes naming people, I guess. So, you know, that's yeah. um a lot of these guys survived the world being blown up too. I they really did. I I'm you know they they came through they came through the apocalypse. They they got through it all right. So hey, good on them. Um yeah. all right, let's let's talk about a couple more scrolls and then wrap this up because we've been going a while. Oh uh, yeah. So uh one of my I, I think one of my hot takes uh is gonna be gut rot spume who got so much better. Uh I love gut rot now. Um, so, uh, like he, he got changed around some, so gut rots, you know, obviously is a named unique guy. Um, what I love about him is they got rid of any idea of him being your general. So like, he doesn't have a command ability anymore. Cause you would have never made him your general anyways. And he's like 140 on points. If memory serves, let me verify that. Yes, that is correct. Uh, and this dude is rock and roll, man. Three up, save seven wound, dude. Um, <laughs> oh, excuse me. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, pretty decent attacks, like three up, two up, neg one ren, two damage attacks with his axe. Cool, neat. Um, but two things that changed about him that I love. Okay. Number one, clutching pseudopods got changed. So now it used to be it just like made a single weapon attack last, right? And now it's choose a weapon for a guy for somebody he's engaged with. And roll a die, and on a four up, that weapon cannot be used by that model in the combat phase. Yep. <laughs> That's real good. So, like, Scarbrand doesn't get to use Carnage this round. Sorry. Uh, you know, that's pretty, pretty good. I think Scarbrand would probably still spike this guy like a football with uh <laughs> with his other axe, but nonetheless, moving on. Uh it doesn't say. <laughs> It doesn't say uh, unless he is slain. So assumingly at the start of the phase, if you roll that four up, even if he gets pasted <laughs> against a wall for when the tentacles are still stuck there for the rest of the round, and I guess he still doesn't get to use it. So, hey, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. And then Master of the Slime Fleet, which is uh, my favorite new thing. Uh, in addition to picturing what the Slime Fleet is, which just sounds like a funny thing, um, instead of setting up gut rot spume on the battlefield, you can place him and up to one unit of putrid blight kings, which can be what 20 models in a unit of putrid blight kings. Is that right? Is that their cap? Yep. I think so. <laughs> uh, uh, you can, and one side and say they are aboard his flagship. What is his flagship named? I mean, I, he, it had a, his old flagship in the old world had a name. Why did we not say they are aboard his flagship? you know, rotten hole or something like give that ship a name. Come on. You had extra space on the page where we could have written some more stuff. But anyways, um, if you do so at the end of your first movement phase, set up gut rot and the unit of pewter putrid black Kings within six inches of each other, wholly within six inches of the edge of the battlefield and nine inches away from, uh, uh, enemy models. Um, that's really good. That's super good to he, that he can move on himself and a big unit of black Kings onto the sort of edge of the battlefield and just like, Hey, what's up? We're here. Time to do some work. And, you know, with that, that, uh, the plague sister, whichever one it was, the, whichever the one was I mentioned earlier, which all those Blight could certainly be a part of. That's a scary proposition. Certainly. Yep. Um, you know, I want to give a shout out real quick to a really uh, unexpected winner, I think, in uh, this whole thing here, is uh, the Rotbringer Sorcerer. Um, it's 120 points, um, and he's the only Rotbringer wizard that can take an artifact. <laughs> 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 um, which seems like pretty good because a lot of the best spells are for rot bringers. So being able to uh, also give him some sort of artifact to help him not die would be great. Um, you know, uh, he can get the, Oh, where was it? He cannot get the uh, Tome of a Thousand Poxes, sadly, which is the one that gives him plus one to cast. Right, but he's he can't mortal take... and Robbringer. Yeah, 
but he can take the Mutter Grub, so he can be a double caster for 120 points. Yep. Yep. Uh, which is really good. Um, his spell is hot garbage, but he can take. <laughs> real- <laughs> um, like, it, like if there's an enemy unit within six or uh, within seven inches of your caster, you are in a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah, this guy. The, the the next sentence is when you're recounting the story is, and then my caster died. Right, <laughs> that's that is way too close, way too close. Uh, yeah, no, I agree. It's funny because he is like the one who isn't named, and so can actually take an artifact. But yeah, his spell is hot trash. That being said, there's nothing wrong with uh, you know, him being like a guy casting some of the other stuff in the back, right? And just ignore his spell. Like he can be your Mystic Shield slash cycle resetter guy slash whatever the mortal or rot bringer spell of your choice that you like is right. So there you go. Like you, who cares that his spell is trash? He, he's got like a bajillion other spells at this point. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, the interesting thing that comes with having the, the spell book plus every uh, Nurgle wizard knows the uh, spell to reset the dial. That means every one of your wizards knows five spells. Yeah. It's a lot of magic. It's a it lot is. of magic. <laughs> um, I, I, so I feel like anybody that's a caster is really super good. Um, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of magic potential in this book, which is funny um, because I don't think of, I don't think of Nurgle as being like the magic thing. I Not that I think this guy is going to out magic zines or anything, but you know, it's, there's a lot of really, really great combat oriented spells in here. Right. Um, that are that are real tide turners. Uh, on the Rotbringer spellcaster tip, can we swing over to Festus the Leech Lord? Can we swing over to this to this brick house just ready to just ready to post up on fools? Yep. Uh, maybe MVP of the book, Festus the Leech Lord. Out of nowhere, I don't think anybody really cared that much about this guy. He's 140 points. And this dude is ready to just drive the paint. So six wound, you know, four inch move, five save model. Pfft, who cares? Okay. Mortal Robbringer hero. Obviously he's named, so he can't have the special crap. Don't care. Here's why I like this guy. Uh, I mentioned 140. So he has his little healing elixirs that he gets to heal one wound every round. And then he also has his delightful bruise and splendid restoratives where you can roll a die and on a two up, you get to pick a unit around him or himself and heal D3 wounds. Uh, Or if it's an enemy unit, they suffer D3 mortal wounds. But uh, in addition to that, he has a spell which shall henceforth be referred to as Curse of the Ball Buster because it's Curse of the Leper. Uh, Casting value of seven. Not great, but not horrible. If successfully cast, select a unit within 14 inches. Subtract one from the save rolls of that unit for the rest of the battle. What? Yep. <laughs> what? Uh, I don't what? care that that goes off on a seven. I don't. I will cast that every turn. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Now, you, you know, we talked about, like, I said I don't want to get too deep into bail win targets, but... <laughs> that makes me want to put that guy on a bail wind. Like that dude plus the, the Lord of Afflictions going in with the rust blade says like, goodbye saves. Like <laughs> just forget it. Like you don't have a save anymore because that dude himself is like neg one and neg two rend just as it is. Right. And then your saves just went down by two. Uh, Well, you're dead. I guess you don't have saves anymore. That's not, we can just skip that phase or that part of the damage resolution. That's not relevant. Uh, yeah. so that's pretty good. I dig that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I mean, there's just so many mean things that you can do. And it's unfortunate that like, a, like, you know, it's on so many, it, we have that like weird, uh, nonbo of our artifact that gives us plus one to save. I'm sorry, one plus one to cast is uh, only for demons, and some of our best spells are for rot bringers. Right. Um, so, I mean, that's unfortunate, but 
I mean, Bell and Vortex is a thing. And, uh, you know, it, and quantity of magic is a thing. Yeah. Um, it, it, the other thing, I think, you know, maybe if it, unless you have any other specific uh, units you want to call out. That's all one that I, that's all the ones that I really wanted to mention. But what do you got one more we can close out on? Uh, it really just more of a thought overall. Sure. That um, if you build this army right, they don't care if they go first. In fact, in a lot of situations, they want you to go first. Because a lot of these spells have 14 inch range. Yeah. And a lot of these abilities, like, you know, are very conditional on your opponent being near you. Um, and your guys don't generally move that fast, although there are ways to get them to move faster. Um, I mean, there's... If you're in a bad situation, a unit of, like, uh, 30... Uh, uh, oh, why am I... Uh, the plague guys. The <laughs> battle line dudes. My like brain Plague bearers? Plague bearers. That's the one. You just use them to like bubble wrap all of your important stuff. So anything other than like KO is not going to do a lot to you. Um, and even KO is probably going to have trouble on a lot of things. It's not going to get through a whole lot uh, with their shooting since you can just go sit on the board edge and wait for them to come to you um, and kind of take them apart piecemeal. Um, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, this seems like this is an army that is okay to not run low drops. It's okay to go second. It's almost preferable in a lot of situations to go second. You're highly durable to begin with, so any sort of alpha strike shenanigans that your opponent tries to pull, you can probably just kind of shrug off. Uh, at least shrug off way better than the average army can. Yeah, I mean... So here's like Tom and I have been talking about this as he's been building some armies. And I think this is my closing thought for this. This army, as we've discussed, has a lot of different ways you can build it. Like you can build it to beat armor saves, to charge first turn or come on in sneaky ways with Blight Kings, to cause, you know, hit penalties, to bravery bomb, to splash around a bunch of mortal wounds. Like there's to, to play the contagion game. There are lots of different things you can do. You can't do all of them at once, right? Like, you you need to pick, like, two things or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like, he, he kept running into problems because he was trying to shove all of it into one list. And what he was getting was, like, lists that couldn't really do anything. And then he yeah. stopped and said, instead, what I want to do is this theme. You know, I'm going to carry, this is my Blight Kings are, you know, uh, uh, nutcrackers that get across the board or drop in in unusual ways and, and destroy armor army. Okay, great. We can do those two things, right? Or this is my super heavy spell casting army that, uh, that uh, with Rodigus that has like just mortal wounds crapping out everywhere and all that kind of stuff. Right. And okay. Yep. That's also a thing, but like, if you try to do all of it at once, you're just going to have a bad time. It's, it's pizza when you should have French fried. So. Yeah. I mean, it, it seems like what this army is just really good at in general is being very, very bad to your opponent. <laughs> <laughs> like, like debuffing the crap out of your opponent in one way or another seems to be just be like the thing that it's really good at. Just making whatever your opponent wants to do very ineffective. Right. Um, yeah. And it, I think if you play on that theme and work with that as, you know, your thing in mind and build your lists and build your strategies in such a way that, you know, you have at least some sort of reasonable answer to all of the crazy things that uh, your opponent's going to try and do to you, uh, you know, I think it'll be pretty okay. I think you'll be able to put together a pretty competitive list. I mean, there's just so many things that, like, just debuff your opponent in really, really discourteous ways. Like, yeah. Yep. 
I agree. And what I would say is, so the question came up in the comments about Slaves to Darkness stuff. We're not going to jump into it because I wanted to focus more on this book, but it is worth mentioning that don't forget you can, you know, you can include like your Nurgle Skaven stuff and your Nurgle Slaves to Darkness stuff without breaking allegiance. So there's probably a bigger conversation to be had about, okay, what, what if that has value? Cause there's certainly some good stuff in there. Um, but you know, obviously that, funny forge world too. Yeah. There's just a, because of Tamerkin's horde. So there's like a huge world of other things outside of this book that can actually sneak into this army. Right. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this like instantly became just such a massive force. And I think it's going to take people a while to explore all that because you're right. Like all that Tamerkin stuff out of forge world, Skaven pestilence stuff, uh, slaves to darkness stuff. Where are those interactions? Where are those little combos? You know, there's going to be plenty of that hidden around. So, yep. Uh, in the end, I think we'll see lots of different armies tried out of here. And I wouldn't even hazard a guess as to, I, I think there will be one or two very, very competitive forces that come out of this. Like when I say that, I mean like very, very competitive. Um, but I have no idea what those are yet. I just get the general sense. Like, I feel like I'm, uh, it's the, the, uh, blind man touching the elephant, right? I'm too close to it as it were. Um, but like, I get the sense that I'm touching a very big thing. Uh, I just, yes. you know, whatever. So. Yeah. It, it, there's just so many things that are just really good. And yep. I mean, it, I mean, you can build a list that's just like stacking bravery debuffs and then you, uh, don't chaos knights, uh, debuff yep. bravery too. Yes, they do. I, and that's a mortal ability, by the way. That mortal yeah. command trait that does that. Yup. Yeah. Yep. And then, okay, then you can build that into a uh, the uh, ever-chosen battalion and have that whole thing revolving around debuffing bravery and debuffing to hit. And, oh, Christ. <laughs> like, I literally, I've just been, like, staring at these war scrolls, and I'm like, this is all really good. I just don't know how to make a list. Like, yeah. I don't even know what to purchase. It's all, it, it is quite overwhelming. Uh, I'd say, you know, find the thing that you like and, and that you want to paint and want to play with and go with. It. I think there's going to be a lot of different lists out there. And I think most of them will be fun and effective. If you're not concerned with like top tabling a tournament, I think there's going to be many effective, effective lists out of this. You know what I'm saying? Like there's a difference between effective and top table one lists. Right. Um, yeah, so. yeah, yep. and that's, um, I, I just, I, I don't know. I, I like what this has to offer in general. It's just, I need to sit down and study this to sure. really pull things out of it. Um, because there's not a lot of like auto include stuff. Except for Festus the Leech Lord. No. All right. Anyway. So who, and who probably just... a great on one, let's be honest. Sure. <laughs> Uh, all right. So there you go. That's our initial thoughts. Like we will return to this at some point. We'll have to, because Tom will put a gun to my head once he, assuming he doesn't die from whatever he's got, you know, I mean, I don't know if he does, I guess I'll find a new co-host, but if he doesn't, then we're going to have to return to this because Tom's not going to let us like not talk about Nurgle in more detail at some point in time. So maybe we'll do like a, a competitive list thing a couple months from now, once this all shakes out. We'll get Paul back on. We'll take a look back at what we said and what we liked and see what's actually risen to the top. So as yeah. with all of this, we will return to Nurgle uh, yet again and, and visit the grandfather in his happy garden and, and see what he's got to share with us after everybody has time to digest all of this. Yeah. And, and we need to have that live on air argument about why Tom is wrong about Rodigus. Absolutely. I, I can't <laughs> wait. I think, I think history will prove you correct, but we will see. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, uh, for everybody else out there, thank you very much for watching. Paul, appreciate you being here, buddy. This was a great time. Super fun Pleasure to break this down. Uh, and Tom, feel better, buddy. Don't die. It's all right. Uh, if you want, Don't die. we need you. Yeah, I mean, I can like try to find you a vampire if you want, like the story and who can make you better. But you know, I don't, I don't know any. So maybe if anybody I, knows any, send him his way. I uh, know, I know a guy. I know a guy, but he's gonna need a goat and a dead chicken to make it work. <laughs> All right. With that, we will say rise, chicken, and see you next Wednesday.
Have a good one, everybody.